So what debate we are going to have is reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Lifestyle is enough as far as primary prevention is concerned. As far as primary prevention is concerned, and that's very important point. I do agree once a patient has got any kind of cardiovascular disease, any atherosclerosis or atherothrombosis, lifespan is significantly shorter. Person has past history of stroke or MI or cardiovascular disease, 7 to 12 years of life is cut, and these people fall under secondary prevention. So using any kind of intervention, surgeries, medicines is very well justified, no doubt. What I'm talking about is just primary prevention, which is a controlling risk factors. We all know that these are the risk factors which are responsible for a variety of cardiovascular disease and where we can take care of a lot of these things by lifestyle only. Smoking, stress, high blood pressure, sedentary life, high cholesterol, diabetes and obesity. Again, as far as primary prevention is concerned, I am not against controlling diabetes by medicine. I am not against controlling blood pressure by medicine. But yes, I am against using medicines without any reason. Like say, use ACE inhibitors for primary prevention. Use aspirin for primary prevention. Use statin for primary prevention. No. This is where I don't agree to my dear friends. What an actress could simply tell when she came back for her second performance in Naj Balye movie, she was too fit after two pregnancies and deliveries, that what is the secret of her beauty and perfect life, what she replied perhaps we are missing. And very important points are, we doctors have entered into wrong world of all just pills, medicines and bills. We all know that pills gives a lot of illness, a lot of bills, but still we are there and we do not think lifestyle modification is really a good option. Look at the WHO list of potentially preventable causes of death, poor sanitation and hygiene, alcohol, physical inactivity, body mass index, fruits and vegetables intake, unsafe sex, underweight, cholesterol, tobacco and high blood pressure. Most of the disease are either totally controllable and cured by lifestyle or they can be helped tremendously by lifestyle modification. Same thing was talked by Interheart study where they said nine modifiable risk factors, if you can manage them well, you can reduce risk of heart attack by 90% and all these nine risk factors are very hugely amenable to lifestyle modification to good extent. Again look at where is the fault, how did the world go wrong. If you look to the per capita income, as the per capita income of people has grown, the food habits have changed. Previously when we were poor we used to use a lot of starch and complex carbohydrates and less animal fats. But as we grew up in economy, our sugar content increased, our complex starch reduced, we started using more unseparated animal fats, more sugars, more animal proteins and perhaps that is one reason our lifestyle has gone to haywire. British Medical Journal produced a beautiful articles promoting adherence to Mediterranean diet improves health status. And this is a meta-analysis of 12 studies including more than 15 lakh patients and studies were for more than 4 to 18 years. My dear friends, very important point is when you talk something for primary prevention, data has to be for at least 5, 10, 12, 15 years. Some Jupiter trial coming here for 20 months statin and they say start statin for everybody, I don't agree to. A very important point, if you look to this BMJ data, all cause mortality is reduced by 9% if you adhere to Mediterranean diet. Cardiovascular mortality is also reduced by 9%. Cancer is reduced, Alzheimer disease is reduced and there is tremendous benefit. My friend may have a discussion that yes, you need statin, which is highly important to reduce LDL cholesterol, but by adjusting your diet only and putting exercise to that, you can reduce your LDL cholesterol to as close as to 40%. There is huge body of data. By improving your diet as far as fiber is concerned, by taking high amount of fiber, whatever glycemic load you take, you can neutralize and risk of development of new onset of diabetes is reduced. So we need to incorporate a lot of fibers. Coming to second point, benefits of regular exercise. Apart from good look and healthy weight, it helps adiposity, improves mean lean body mass, improves blood pressure, insulin sensitivity, endothelial functions and what not. This is a very important slide from the cardiovascular medicine textbook Brown World saying that benefits of weight loss and physical activity on all disease, blood pressure, diabetes, lipids, cancers, stroke, colorectal cancers, breast cancers, etc. A very important point. The fact a person who does regular exercise and physical activity is help and cardiovascular event is reduced was first notified very perfect manner in 1953 in which 31,000 London transport workers were studied and simply one important fact came into mind. Conductors had less chance of heart attack as compared to drivers. So look at the simple truth. Those who keep on walking during daytime in their physical activity keeps on doing it working place, they are helped. What about fitness? We all know that CRP is one of the indicators people say again confusion has not been cleared but those who are perfectly physically fit they have low level of CRP as compared to those who are not fit. Regular exercise when done on very regular basis with intensity it does help to improve HDL cholesterol particularly when triglycerides are also high. Exercise does help various components of lipid profile but most important point it does is it improves the particle size of LDL and HDL to favorable things and so the oxidation of LDL happens less. 
In addition to lots of hemodynamic benefits, what exercise does it? It improves the bone mineral density, reduces person body fat, improves lean body mass, improves glucose metabolism, and improves lipid metabolism. There is huge body of evidence that exercise reduces cardiovascular and all-cause mortality, and this was published in American Journal of Hypertension 2005. Whether a person has normal BP, prehypertension, or hypertension, when he does regular exercise, the risk of mortality is significantly reduced just by exercise. We all know that smoking is a danger to life, and what has been discussed, ample data, and what UK cardiac death rate was reduced by half just by cutting down the smoking. So smoking is a single most important point as far as primary prevention is concerned or secondary, it can have a very heavy impact on cardiovascular mortality. What about prevention of diabetes? Again, doctors keep on trusting lots of medicines, but look at the comparison of lifestyle modification versus metformin. Chance of developing diabetes is much less when you adhere to a good lifestyle as compared to metformin. In fact, lifestyle has impact on all the parameters of metabolic syndrome and so more, like weight is best controlled by lifestyle, insulin sensitivity, triglyceride, HDL, blood glucose, hypertension, endothelial dysfunction, CRP and fibrinogen, all are helped best by lifestyle and none is helped perfectly so well by medicines. JNC7 and all bodies have agreed that yes, you need a good diet plan, a good physical activity, cessation of smoking and moderation of alcohol. Just by doing all this, European Society of Cardiology mentioned lifestyle changes only can reduce I mean, heart disease by 60%. A very important point is use stress situation. We all discuss a lot about diet and exercise and smoking, but perhaps in today's day, the most important point is stress. On this axis, it is stress. On this axis, it is performance and health. There is a physiological limit to which increased stress helps you improve your health and performance. Then you reach a plateau, and then a point comes where further increasing stress does not improve health. One needs to understand where this point lies for me, rather than chasing a lot of aims in life. There has been huge body of evidence that yoga and meditation helps variety of diseases like hypertension, coronary artery disease, apart from giving a good quality of life and improving mindset and psychology. Let me, my dear friends, discuss here for 10 minutes, what is primary prevention? When we discuss primary prevention, we have to understand we are talking about doing something to somebody who never has any symptom. I do not have any problem in my life, and if somebody bombards me, take a statin, take aspirin, take ACE inhibitors, I may go haywire, what's happening? You are giving a medicine for improving future. Fine, but what about cost? What about complexities and adverse effects? That's very important. When you give a medicine to somebody who does not have disease, you are touching his psychology. He may be psychologically impaired that, yes, I have got some disease. A most important point to be seen in primary prevention is how many number you need to treat or get a good benefit versus number needed to harm. So this has to be really good. If they are using some medicine for primary prevention, if you have to treat 10 patients to prevent one event, that's fine. But if you have to treat 1,000 patients to prevent one heart attack by one medicine, I don't think there is a scope. And do remember what oath we talk is, we cannot help patients, that's fine, but we should not do harm to a patient. What about various drugs? Aspirin has been recommended for primary prevention. Look at the data. Yes, it reduces myocardial infarction and coronary events, but there is no reduction in mortality, no reduction in stroke, rather they increase hemorrhagic stroke increase and GI blood increase. So for primary prevention, aspirin is out. All authorities in the world say people with low to intermediate risk should not be given aspirin for primary prevention. What about statin? This was a meta-analysis of 11 randomized control trials, high-risk primary prevention, archives of internal medicine 2010. There was no statistically significant benefits by stating if you give for primary prevention unless there is gross dyslipidemia. My friend may talk about Jupiter trial which was stopped before 20 months. Some drug which you want to be used for primary prevention for millions of people, I don't think 18 months are enough to be checked. Absolutely rubbish idea to give a drug to millions of people just by a data of 18 months in primary prevention. The data was based on HSCRP and HSCRP itself is still has not cleared itself. High sensitivity C-reactive protein is within normal levels at the very onset of first ST segment elevation of acute MI in 41% cases. Where does it go? If a person has got acute MI, CRP has to be high, so it has not cleared. Unfortunately, aspirin has not cleared itself. Statin could not clear itself. People started talking about polypill. Absolutely ridiculous. My dear friend, look at it, all these animals. None of them die because of atherosclerosis. And believe me, they are not on statins and they don't have angioplasties. What a human being has done to himself in the last 50 years is from this to this. By just giving statin or some angioplasty, you cannot make this man look like this. These children do not need any medicines. Just one minute more. We have entered in an artificial era where the drink which we take contains artificial flavoring agents while the toilet washers has added natural lime. 
We have entered an era where we do not exercise but make this cute dog exercise. We have entered an era where we do not love human beings but we have started loving objects and we are quarreling with each other. We have entered an era where we do not love healthy lifestyle but we have started loving pills. So my dear friends, my message is for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, what you need is a good amount of healthy diet, 60 minutes of exercise, cheerful life and cessation of smoking. It's very important that we doctors understand a very vital fact medicines are for us we are not for medicines and interventions thank you very much but let me just uh, give you some sobering facts and uh, Anish Bay uh, talked a little bit about this at the end we are facing a huge epidemic of um, cardiovascular uh, disease and risk factors and this is just one of the major drivers of that diabetes um, globally so here is the WHO estimates of um, uh, the increase in the incidence and prevalence of diabetes uh, globally uh, in 2030. And India is expecting to see 80 uh, million new cases of diabetes alone by uh, the year 2030. So, you know, what, what we're up against is a significant um, epidemic of extreme proportions that's going to affect uh, the majority of the world's population uh, in the coming decades. And we really need to think about strategies that are really going to impact this. Similar to what Anish Bay had said, exercise, there's great data, both observational spanning 70 years ago to even more recent clinical trials, randomized trials, showing the, uh, the benefit of exercise therapy. Uh, this one is, uh, you know, uh, primary prevention in terms of uh, mortality risk in uh, individuals who exercise. Once again, another slide recapitulating uh, data that Anish Bhai has presented shows the uh, benefits of exercise. So here you see 15% of weight reduction, 10% um, in systolic blood pressure reduction, almost 10% in systolic blood pressure reduction, almost 20% of glucose reduction uh, with uh, daily exercise. Uh, an incredible 45 to 50 percent reduction in triglycerides and you know 10 to 12 percent reduction in total cholesterol so huge impact on just uh, lifestyle interventions exercising 20 minutes a day five days a week in terms of really uh, reducing your cardiovascular risk profile I'm going to show this slide again because I think this was a great slide showing that you know medicines can only get, get us so far but the, there's huge impacts uh, uh, pleiotropic effects of exercise in reducing the risk of cardiovascular risk factors, in this case in the di uh, diabetes prevention program, uh, preventing diabetes. So where I'm going to disagree uh, or go off on a tangent with Anish Bay is that I completely agree that lifestyle and behavioral interventions are important, but the problem is, is that patients don't adhere to it. So here's a slide that shows um, nicotine replacement therapy and adherence over time. And you see that even at the start of the onset of the prescription for basic things for smoking sensation, uh, within 30, not even 30 weeks, you see less than 20% of patients actually adhering to the recommendations that their doctors provide. So lifestyle modifications is a huge challenge to our patients. So why have we failed with, with these sort of methodologies? Why over the last 50 years, despite having really excellent data about exercise, lifestyle modification, have we not improved uh, those sobering statistics I started off my talk with? So here's a slide from one of our most recent cardiology conferences, and I want to highlight everyone is on the escalator. And you see this poor person, one person taking the stairs, but everyone is queued up here to, uh, to take the escalator. We are starting to live in a society where people don't value exercise uh, and even this is in a group of cardiologists who understand the data, who appreciate the data, who are telling their patients every day that you need to exercise more, you, lose, you need to lose weight and yet aren't doing themselves. So this is one of the real challenges that we have that we even as doctors don't listen to our own advice. Let me uh, have a raise of hands of people. Pa people who are in the audience who've had patients who come to them and when you make a recommendation to them to do exercise, they say, doctor, can I have a pill? How many, how many of you have had that case where uh, your patients come in asking you for a pill if you say, oh, I need to lose weight or you need to stop smoking or you need to lower your cholesterol with some diet? I get this question at least once a day in my practice when I recommend to patients that they need to exercise more, they need to eat healthy, um, they need to cut down uh, sugary sweet foods, desserts. They say, doctor, just give me a pill and I'll, everything will be okay. 
This is the type of culture and mentality we live in, in terms of really impacting uh, primary prevention with just lifestyle modification. So, so really the, the key considerations here and the problems is that we don't have easy reminders for patients or providers to continue to um, remind uh, high-risk patients that they need uh, to do these things every day with every meal uh, multiple times a day. Also, even as doctors, as I showed you in the slide before, where everyone is waiting for the escalator, we're really uh, focused on stenting, you know, uh, you know, uh, surgeries, stress tests. We're really uh, more focused on the acute care as opposed to preventive care. And this is also true for our patients as well. They wait to the last minute to see us. There's not a whole lot of investment in primary prevention. And then there's high cost of preventive services. You have to tell the patients, well, I need to eat healthier. Sometimes that's more expensive to find uh, fresh food, good vegetables, um, you know, uh, things that don't have artificial sweeteners. Um, and also even things like uh, trying to find a gym membership or go to the swimming pool. These all things cost money. And for some uh, patients, they don't have uh, that money. Finally, you know, time. We all live very busy lifestyles. People now working 12, 14 days. They say, doctor, I don't have time even for 15 minutes uh, to sit down and eat. How am I going to find, you know, 20 minutes a day to exercise? And you can understand the paradox there as well. So, you know, well, this comes back. Uh, patients come back to you saying it's easiest to take pills. And this is going to be the basis of my argument is to say, I don't agree with anything that Anish has said, but we really are facing a true epidemic here, and we need to start impacting this um, today. So I was asked about statins. I haven't addressed anything in terms of the other modifiable risk for this, but really going to present some of the data around statins and saying, you know, statins is going to be one arm. Um, in this primary prevention battle. So here, I'm going to really just focus on the data. We have a lot of good data um, to show that in primary prevention clinical trials that um, there is a reduction in LDL. As Anish Bay has presented, though, uh, those trials have been equivocal in terms of uh, meta-analyses and all that. But once again, uh, the focus should not be on patients with no risk factors, but it should be on patients who have uh, multiple risk factors, family history, that we should be really targeting these primary prevention uh, efforts again. So for the patients who don't have high blood pressure, who don't have high cholesterol, who are not obese, who exercise, I completely agree. We should not be focusing our efforts on them. However, the patients who are obese, who have impaired fasting glucose, who may already be showing some signs of early diabetes, um, who live sedentary lifestyle, those are the patients that we should be targeting because those are going to be the highest risk of uh, developing coronary disease over time. So, in fact, despite the data and the meta-analysis that Nishmay has presented, the AHA still recommends that in patients with um, high-risk features with LDL that's out of control, that they should be treated to specific goals listed here. The beauty of also treating lipids is that we have multiple statins available on the market. This is the most widely used class of medications in the world. Um, atorvastatin or Lipitor just went generic in the United States for us. Um, it created $81 billion of revenue for Pfizer since it bought it from Warmer, Warner Lambert about 10 years ago. Number one prescribed medicine in the U.S., one of the top prescribed medicines in the world, and we have many choices with really efficacious reduction in LDL to choose from. However, we don't use it enough. Here you can see in the U.S. in clinical practice, less than 30 percent of patients who are at risk for cardiovascular disease who have high cholesterol, who have diabetes, are actually on um, appropriate therapy uh, with um, um, appropriate LDL levels. But, and once again, I think there's growing recognition of the benefits of statin therapy. And you can see over time uh, the, the, the use of these medications, as I mentioned, has grown. Extremely safe medications, very low risk profile. Um, some patients do develop some muscle cramps, myopathies, but um, s simply switching them to a different statin or even to another non-statin therapy to get their cholesterol uh, at goal will significantly impact their risk um, for diseases. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but uh, the effects of statins is even more than just lipids. There's pleiotropic effects that helps uh, prevent uh, uh, future cardiac events in terms of thrombosis risk, inflammation, um, and uh, blood viscosity. 
So why does everyone need a statin? Well, uh, hopefully I've argued to you that I don't agree at all with anything Anish Bay has said, but I think lifestyle uh, behavioral interventions are very hard, um, and uh, patients request pills, and they are actually more adherent to those uh, than the lifestyle recommendations that we make. Statins are safe, cheap, and effective with lots of clinical data, and there's great data, in my view, for high-risk patients who would benefit in, in a primary uh, prevention setting. And widespread use could dis uh, decrease the epidemic of CV uh, risks that we're uh, being presented to. Um, I'm running a little bit of time, but in the UK, they've uh, basically made simvastatin over the counter. The regulators believe strongly in this um, um, uh, policy. So thank you. Data in primary prevention, even what Dr. Bimalsa showed, if you look to the initial trials, F-caps, TEX-caps, Helsinki heart studies, the number of patients were very few, and the limits beyond which uh, treatment was started was LDL cholesterol more than 170, 180. I think they are the patients perhaps who will get benefit by statin when primary prevention, but talking 110 LDL cholesterol without any other cardiovascular disease, giving statin, I don't think is use, I mean, useful. And statistics, we all know that. There are certain juggleries with statistics because of so many things. And see, uh, hardly any clinicians exist who does not have doubt about any kind of manipulation which happens to statistics. No statin trial done to suggest benefits of statin over and above healthy lifestyle. So that's very important. This is where we have to do something. And there can be a lot of conflicts of interest, as I said. Trials do exclude so many people. Trials of people who are very well screened, very well selected, but if you go to the real world, the scenario may be different and you have to match their need. What is the difference between drug and poison? There are only three, I'll always believe. Each drug is a potential poison. Even a single drug pill can kill a human being. The three difference between drug and poison is right indication, right dose, and right intention. So we need to understand as a clinician, we are having huge responsibility when we write a drug, at least for primary prevention. What Mahatma Gandhi said is, indulgence without discretion can be a crime. So when we write a drug for primary prevention, we need to understand what we are doing. When we write a statin to somebody with LDL cholesterol of 115 and HSCRP of 2, to somebody who is 36 years of age, I need to understand he is going to take tons of statin in the next 30 years. So it's important. I don't say don't write medicines for primary prevention, yes, but when patient is really, really at very high risk. So whatever I believe House may decide, I have decided to go alone. Lifestyle is good for any kind of primary prevention. Thank you very much. I think we, we, we're, we're saying, we continue to say the same thing. Um, and we both, uh, I think, are in agreement that uh, lifestyle behavioral modification is, should be the first, second, third, all the way to number 10 in terms of how we approach patients, uh, all of our patients, regardless of whether it's primary prevention or secondary prevention. However, and those patients that do have high-risk features, who have family histories, who we know are sedentary, who are obese, if the, if the data suggests or their clinical parameters suggest that they need a primary prevention pill, I would say we need to emphasize that. And once again, I'm going to go back to this slide. We have the opportunity to really impact uh, the global burden of disease here, particularly here in India, which is going to lead the world in the burden of cardiovascular disease over the next 30 years. That I think we can't do it alone just with lifestyle modification, particularly in those high-risk patients. So we need to really start to intervene with really safe and effective medications and in the right patients uh, with the right clinical features who can tolerate it. I think statins are an excellent choice to help reduce that risk. Thank you. And this was just on uh, 12th of July. Now the history the patient gave was, uh, there was hypertension, diabetes, patient is on uh, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and uh, 
some diuretics and the only other positive finding was there is agyarus in Gujarati in the, and agyarus the patient had food which was cooked in a specific type of salt which is potassium rich and when the potassium was done the potassium came as 9.3 so severe hyperkalemia very wide QRSs look at the T waves these are tall tented T waves if this were anything else people would consider this agonal rhythm and a patient gasping probably nothing would more would be done but in the emergency the patient was fine about an hour ago came gasping this was the rhythm immediately we suspected this must be hyperkalemia gave him injection calcium gluconate wheeled him to the cath lab started temporary pacing and uh, potassium came in started all the treatment for that so hyperkalemia can present like this and there is fairly good correlation between ECG and serum levels the earliest sign is peaked T waves and that starts at around 5.7 milli equivalents per liter when you see ECGs like this tall tented T wave we don't wait for the blood report to come in the moment you suspect this in a background of what medications the patient is on we, you will just start the treatment because within a few minutes the patient can the patient circling the drain here within a few minutes the patient can just you will lose the patient and at 7 milli equivalents per liter reduction of P wave amplitude intraatrial conduction delay PR prolongation by 8 milli equivalents the P wave is absent this patient was somewhere here 9 to 11 milli equivalents per liter QRS becoming very wide and 12 VF or arrest follows look at this wide QRSs you can hardly see the P waves anywhere and tall tented T waves now that the patient has recovered do you think the patient requires any kind of permanent pacing looking at this ECG can you deduce anything you cannot and this patient look at this this was just 12 hours later next day morning the patient is in sinus rhythm narrow QRS normal PR and the conduction is perfect so just this electrolytemia hyperkalemia can produce such a bizarre ECG you would think this patient is not going to make it beyond the next five minutes and within 12 hours you have salvaged everything patient is fine in the temporary pacing wire was taken off after 48 hours and the patient went home after three days <laughs> nothing his creatinine was in fact around 1.9 and that was also transient maybe because of the deterioration just in few hours and the creatinine improved to less than one within uh, 48 hours or so so a combination of ACE inhibitors potassium sparing diuretics and the potassium rich salt that everything that was cooked on that day was potassium rich the patient had this problem and was fine later so these things can strike anytime and you need to keep your eyes and ears open take history this was only on detailed history the way Milan Bai takes history he sits with the patient his OPD runs from 7 in the, uh, 9 in the morning till 10 in the night he's spending 45 minutes one hour with each patient so history history and history with uh, very detailed history he got this uh, clue what would what was what happened to the patient right and this is a similar patient I had shown this actually last year some of you might remember 65 year old lady dyspnea pre syncope she had come to the heart care clinic in the OPD to see me and she was a history of COPD and uh, uh, diabetes she was on beta blockers ACE inhibitors diuretics and she came with severe breathlessness for the past couple of days and when she presented again you can see the clue the P waves are almost absent the QRS is getting a little broad but look at the impressive T waves these are tall tented T waves all signs of hyperkalemia and in front of our eyes 
the patient was just hooked onto a defibrillator and the ECG strips are from the defibrillator. We put in a IV, started calcium gluconate, but in front of our eyes, within 10-15 minutes, the rhythm deteriorated to this, bradycardia, white QRSs, she was worsening, isoprenaline, atropin to increase the heart rate in some ways, but the ideoventricular rhythm, that became faster and the patient almost had non-sustained VTs and ventricular tachycardia. And patient was then shifted to the hospital. This was a temporary pacing wire which was put in. You can see this paced rhythm. Creatinine again just 1.9, potassium 6.9. It depends on how fast the potassium rises. It's not also, not also the absolute number, but the rate of rise. If the potassium changes from 4.5 to 6.5 within three hours, it will be, the patient can have dramatic consequences. But in diabetic nephropathy, potassium persistently on the higher side, even with a level of 5.5, 6.5, no, the patient may not be that bad. So it's the rate of rise of potassium which also makes a difference. And after a couple of, uh, after uh, 24 hours, the patient's rhythm settled down, temporary wire was taken out, there was underlying right bundle branch block, but the patient is fine after that. So hyperkalemia is an emergency. You need to take immediate measures, otherwise you can lose the patient in front of your eyes. Okay, this is an interesting case. This is ECG number two. This patient is a 17-year-old boy and he had come from Ratlam. And the story was he was bicycling. He had sudden dizziness. He went and sat down and just collapsed. And the patient was taken into the hospital. The rhythm was ventricular tachycardia. It became changed morphology. It uh, degenerated to ventricular fibrillation. Patient was shocked and revived. And then the patient's rhythm showed this. So 17 year old boy, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, sudden cardiac arrest survivor, what I talked about yesterday. Absolutely fine otherwise, no other problems. And when the patient was in the hospital, he was in overt failure. There was shortness of breath, basal creps, and this was the rhythm. What do you think is this? Atrial fibrillation, yes. So the patient had atrial fibrillation, fast ventricular rates, and uh, occasionally there are uh, the ventricular rate becomes slow, becomes fast again. The Treating physician was very experienced, but he was having a lot of trouble to manage this patient. Atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate, he had started beta blockers. You cannot start at a higher dose, he is in failure. So IV amiodarone was started. But on IV amiodarone, the patient started getting repeated ventricular tachycardias again. And he noticed that there was QT prolongation. So the patient was just sent to Ahmedabad. And we did an echo. Dilated RA, RV, LV, severe biventricular dysfunction. EF was, the LV function was around 25%. The RV was quite dilated. No pulmonary hypertension. No valvular disease as such. And uh, we considered a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. Now what happens here is, the normal rhythm will be coming from the sinus node. This patient had dilated RV, dilated RA. Uh, dilated LV, RA is dilated and that can trigger atrial fibrillation. The underlying rhythm, what the patient presented with was ventricular tachycardia, but he, the current problem was atrial fibrillation. And to control the ventricular rate, we are giving amiodarone, but you are giving, getting proarrhythmias with amiodarone. So how do you manage this patient? How do you take care of this problem? Remember a young patient, 17 year old and major, major issues. ICD, yes, that would be the final therapy and that was done for the patient. But we stopped the amiodarone. We don't want proarrhythmia to complicate everything. And with gradually escalating dose of beta blockers, we managed to control the ventricular rate. The patient was cardioverted and he was put into sinus rhythm later, but 
as the patient stabilized in 48 hours or so when the ventricular rate was well controlled, failure was a little better, we implanted a deep ablator for this patient. He still has atrial fibrillation, but as you can see, the ventricular rate is a better control. And then subsequently, cardioversion was done. And now the patient is in sinus rhythm. There is underlying right bundle branch block. QRS is not that broad. In older patients with severe RV, LV dysfunction, the QRS can be broad. But here, younger patient, the conduction system is very slick. It will, the electrical impulse travels very fast. And if both ventricles are dilated, the conduction delay may be equal on both sides, on the right side and on the left side. So you may not get very wide QRSs. So the patient had a right bundle branch block, not very wide QRS, and he was stabilized on beta blockers. Later on, after a couple of weeks, we restarted amiodarone at a smaller dose. He is on decongestive therapy and is now doing well. So this can be also catastrophic presentations. Patients, 17 year old boy presenting with sudden cardiac arrest. We need to be very aggressive in treating these patients. On defibrillator, now the patient is doing well. Okay, let's go to the third one. Some dilated cardiomyopathy, we are not very sure. Often that is what happens in dilated cardiomyopathy. We can presume that some of these patients had myocarditis or subclinical myocarditis in the past and uh, that is now burnt out and patient has now presented with just cardiomyopathy. And the first presentation in this patient was what, with ventricular tachyarrhythmias, with sudden cardiac arrest. Just like what I told you yesterday in, this, in sudden cardiac arrest lecture. That the first presentation can be sudden cardiac arrest. 50% of deaths are due to sudden cardiac arrest. And that is exactly what we saw in this patient. So, 60 years old gentleman comes with palpitations, shortness of breath, fatigue. This is the ECG. Fairly straightforward. Atrial flutter. Now, there, is, there was some terminology in the past. Are you aware? Typical flutter and atypical flutter. Okay. So, what you mean to say is if the AV conduction, generally in, when you see atrial flutter, the patient generally presents with a ventricular rate of 150. Okay. Generally, 150. And it is 2 is to 1. AV conduction generally, okay. And if you give these patients beta blockers, AV node slowing agents, the conduction will jump from 2 is to 1, uh, from 4 is to 1, to 2 is to 1, to 1 is to 1. So the rate can change from 150 to 75 beats per minute. Or if the AV conduction becomes faster, it can jump to 300 beats per minute. The atrial flutter, the atrial activity is going at around 300 beats per minute. But the AV node is able to conduct only the alternate beats. So it is 2 is to 1 conduct. But the typical and atypical terminology has nothing to do with the AV nodal conduction. AV nodal conduction is just a function of how the AV node is able to conduct those impulses. Typical or atypical nature is dependent on how the flutter circuit is. Okay, in the atrium. This is an AV nodal independent arrhythmia. AV node re-entry, accessory pathway mediated, circus mediated tachycardia are dependent on AV node. But atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, these are all AV nodal independent, AV node independent arrhythmias. They don't care what the AV node is doing. The abnormality, the abnormal circuit, abnormal focus is all in the atrium. So it's AV node independent atrial arrhythmias. And when we talk about typical flutter, what is understood is this patient would, uh, this ECG shows the sawtooth wave pattern, very regular sawtooth wave pattern and the flutter waves are negative in the inferior leads, negative deflection in the inferior leads, 2, 3 and AVA and a positive deflection in V1. This ECG also shows this, this is typical or classic atrial flutter. Okay, negative sawtooth wave, flutter waves in 2, 3, AVF and positive flutter waves in V1. 
Why do you get this? Because the circuit in atrial flutter, I told you it's an AV nodal independent arrhythmia. The circuit is around the tricuspid annulus. Okay? AV node re-entrant tachycardia or usual garden variety of SVT occurs here. If there are accessory pathway mediated tachycardias, those circuits occur here. They are dependent on AV node for the re-entry circuit. But atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardias all arise from the atria and the flutter circuit is around the tricuspid annulus. And the negative flutter waves, negative pattern in the inferior leads is produced inscribed on the ECG because of the way the septum gets activated. This is a counterclockwise flutter. This is what is understood as classic or typical flutter. Right? It's going counterclockwise as you look at the tricuspid annulus. And the septum here gets activated from below upwards. Yes? So the septum gets activated initially the inferior septum, then mid, then the superior, then rest of the atrium. So, the inferior leads will show negative flutter wave pattern. When a patient, in, a person is in sinus rhythm, the impulse comes from sinus node downwards. So, that will produce positive P waves in 2-3 AVF. Yeah, in the inferior leads, the P wave will be positive. It activates the atrium from right to left. So, it will be positive and one in AVL. That is what is the definition of a normal sinus P wave, isn't it? Then we talk about coronary sinus rhythm, low atrial rhythm. There the impulse is coming from around this region. It goes from below upwards and that produces negative P waves in the inferior leads. It's the same concept. Here atrial flutter, the circuit is around the tricuspid annulus and the septum is getting activated from below upwards. So since it is below upwards, the atrial activation, the predominant inscription on the ECG will be negative. So the flutter waves are negative and this is a classic counterclockwise atrial flutter or typical atrial flutter. Now in some patients and especially in the EP lab when we are doing manipulations, we are giving electrical stimulation, we are doing a lot of study of this flutter, these patients can somehow, sometime, the flutter circuit can just go in the opposite direction and it can become a clockwise atrial flutter. So the circuit can go in this direction and that time what will happen to the flutter waves can just become positive. So here it is. This is the counterclockwise flutter, negative flutter waves in 2-3 AVF, positive in V1 and if the circuit just reverses, it becomes positive in 2-3 AVF and negative in V1. But the basic underlying problem is the same. The circuit is going around this now, if I give this patient, as you can see, if I give this, the conduction to the ventricle, it depends on what the conduction of the, what is the condition of the AV node. If the patient is not on any drugs, generally it will be 2 is to 1 AV conduction. The ventricular rate is 150 beats per minute. Time and again I have shown you ECGs with a ventricular rate of 150 beats per minute and time and again I have told you, when the rate is 150 beats per minute, always think of atrial flutter with 2 is to 1 AV conduction. Look for the flutter waves. And if I give this patient beta blockers, verapamil, amidarone, the AV nodal conduction will slow down and the patient may have 4 is to 1 conduction. So this is how it is, classic counterclockwise atrial flutter. And the problem here is, this is the slow conduction zone. This is the inferior vena cava, coronary sinus, tricuspid annulus. The way we tackle this arrhythm arrhythmia apart from the pharmacological method is in this slow conduction zone, it is called the KVO, that is the IVC, tricuspid, that is the tricuspid annulus, isthmus. So KVO, tricuspid, isthmus, it is the neck of the chicken, it is this thin area which we can just ablate, we can interrupt the conduction here and the flutter circuit will be interrupted and the patient will not get flutter anymore. Yes? So we put in catheters like this during the EP study. There are, uh, this is called a halo catheter. It's like the halo around the god or goddess, okay? And we get the signals on the halo, halo catheter. And this is the ablation catheter. This is the IVC, tricuspid annulus, 
This is the cavo tricuspid isthmus. This is the thin area through which the impulse is rising. And then it activates the entire atrium. And I will just ablate and interrupt the circuit. And the patient will not get flutter anymore. You have created a cavo tricuspid isthmus conduction block. The success rate is more than 95% in these patients. And they will not be bothered with the flutter again. So classic atrial flutter is classic counterclockwise atrial flutter. Counterclockwise -clock atrial flutter, the circuit is in the opposite direction. But the re-entrant circuit, the way it works is the same, through the same area. So both circuits, both types of flutters, you can ablate by a single line of block. Now this was done very fast here. It is not this fast, it takes a little longer than this. Uh, but that's how it works. Atypical flutters, when we talk about atypical flutters, what was understood in the past was maybe there are flutter circuits here, 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 which are giving rise to this atypical flutter, where the ECG doesn't look like the classic counterclockwise sawtooth wave negative in 2, 3 AVF pattern. There the P wave, the flutter wave, may be of slightly different morphology. That can happen in patients who have atrial fibrillation, but with very, uh, there is a lot of, um, the activation of the atrium occurs ac across a certain area, across the Bachmann's bundle. So the atrial fibrillation is occurring here, but the activation of right atrium, the passive activation of atrium gives an appearance that there may be flutter going on. But usually these are all chaotic rhythms and it is basically atrial fibrillation going on in these patients. It's not showing up. This is the fluoroscopic projection of when we ablate. This is the RAO projection. You can imagine the right atrium is here. The right ventricle is here. I have put in catheters in different places. This is a halo catheter. You are seeing it sideways. I start ablating. This is the inferior vena cava. This is the tricuspid annulus here. We start ablating and drag the ablation catheter back till you create a conduction block and that will interrupt the flutter. So the patient is having atrial flutter here going on, ablation on and the flutter terminates, patient is in sinus rhythm. Yes? So it's a curative form of treating this kind of arrhythmia. It's a little difficult to pharmacologically manage atrial flutter because the ventricular rate, unlike atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation Ventricular rate, patient's ventricular rate may be 160. You start beta blockers, IV amio or oral amio, the rates gradually come down, 160s, 140s, 130s, 100s, 80s, and then you can scale back your medication. But atrial flutter, it doesn't happen that way. Atrial activity is at 300. The AV node can conduct 4 is to 1, 2 is to 1, 1 is to 1. So it jumps, it jumps from 150 beats per minute to 75 beats per minute. So the patients may be very uncomfortable with that. And those patients who are difficult, these patients we tackle with a special system. I talked to you about this, the three-dimensional mapping system, the CARTO biosense mapping system. We recreate the geometry of the atria in the heart. These colorful things are not something I have painted. This is electrical activity, which is rendered by the computer into these images. What I see on the electrical activity here, the timing is also re is represented by these colors. So this is the right atrium. This is the LAO view. This little man is looking towards the right side, LAO view. And the same thing is seen here. Red is early, green is later, blue is later. So the activation is counterclockwise. Yes, so this is a classic counterclockwise atrial flutter. And what we do is ablate at these little pink spots. This is the cavo tricuspid isthmus. I ablate this and the flutter is terminated. Atypical flutters, it's a whole different ball game. It can be due to scars following surgery. It can be due to scars and degenerative age related issues. It can be atrial fibrillation coming from the left atrium and passively activ activating the right atrium. So those patients need to be tackled a little differently. Okay, I've seen this, I've shown this ECG sometime in the past, but that time probably it was a little too early for the people here.
And uh, now I think after 10 years of looking at these ECG booklets and attending these ECG sessions, I think this is prime time for this ECG. Okay. You have this in your ECG booklet. This is number four. 70 year old gentleman presented with syncope. Not very difficult. I have even written the diagnosis for your benefit. But that is not the, that is not why I showed you this ECG. The reason I showed you this ECG is something totally different. So let's start with the first. Gopal by 70, 72 year old gentleman presented with, this is a high grade AV block, isn't it? Okay, so the patient has presented with CHV. When you look at a 12 lead ECG and you are deciding regarding the width of QRS, don't look at the lead which shows you a nice normal looking QRS. Look at the lead which shows the widest QRS. The width of the QRS will be decided by what the widest QRS is. So here it looks narrow, but actually here it looks narrow. But this is a wide QRS escape prism. And like you said, it's RBBB pattern. The QRS is almost 120 milliseconds here. Yes, RSR dash pattern. So RBBB pattern. And what is the axis of the escape rhythm? It's positive in 1, positive in 2, 3 AVF. It's almost normal, isn't it? So remember this. Complete heart block, wide QRS escape, RBBB pattern. Uh, patient was having syncope, so what is the next logical thing to do for this patient? Put in a temporary pacemaker before we do anything else. So I showed you this for some reason, yes. When we put a temporary pacemaker, where do we put it in? The temporary pacing wire generally goes from the femorals through the IVC, across RA, across tricuspid annulus into the RV apex. That is where it is the most stable. Even when we are putting it through the subclavian vein, especially in the peripheral centers where you are working, where fluoroscopy may not be working, that may be the easiest way to do it. Subclavian vein and try to position it in the RV. So we try to position it in the RV apex, that is where it is the most stable. And this is the temporary pacing ECG. So LBBB like pattern, you have a predominantly negative QRS now in V1, LBBB like pattern and positive in 1, negative in 2, 3 and AVF. So it's LBBB like pattern and left axis. Do you expect this with your usual temporary pacing? Yes or no? Yes, that is what you expect because the temporary pacing wire is sitting here. Okay and it activates the ventricle in this direction. So RV is getting activated first, LV later, so it's LBBB like pattern, correct? And it activates from the RV apex in this direction, direction of China, so it is left axis, yeah? LBBB left axis. Now you also tell me, what is the relation between the atrial activity and ventricular activity? Is there any relation? You can see some P waves here, you can see some here, maybe here, maybe here. Is there any relation between the atrium and ventricle? No relation, correct? Because this is, patient has AV block and you have put in a temporary pacing wire in the RV apex, you are doing nothing with the atrium, okay? So this is fine and next day the patient had this rhythm. Now you tell me what this rhythm is and whether I need to re-adjust the temporary pacing. Just describe the ECG. Now tell me, the patient has a regular rhythm. What is the sinus rhythm? Yes, you can see this P waves before each and every QRS and at least in this strip, 12 lead strip, you can see that there seems to be good 1 is to 1 AV conduction from the atrium to the ventricle. The PR is not changing, right? Yes? What about the QRSs? Wide, but that is the most basic thing. Describe the QRS to me, what the morphology is like. 
LBBB pattern and what is the axis? Left axis, positive and lead 2, negative and 3 and AVF it is biphasic. Yeah, it's near normal axis. So why did this happen to the patient? Recovery in conduction, you are reading this, okay. <laughs> so what was happening here? What is the difference between this rhythm and this rhythm? Both are LBBB like pattern. This is the spontaneous rhythm and here what is happening is the impulse comes from here. This patient has AV block but now the impulse is able to crawl across the left bundle and able to activate the ventricle. So you are getting a near normal axis. Isn't it? Because it is conducting across the normal conduction system. There is disease. That is why you have left bundle branch block. So, but activation is occurring via the normal conduction system. With temporary pacing, you are a left axis because you are stimulating via the myocardium. Yes? So, sinus rhythm, recovery in conduction, LBBB pattern. And then a permanent pacemaker was implanted. And this is the ECG after that. Can somebody interpret this for me? Is the patient now in sinus rhythm or something else? Sinus rhythm. So the atrial activity is constant. What about, what about the AV conduction? Is it 1 is to 1 or is it something else? Is each P wave going down to the ventricle, is it conducted? What about the QRS pattern? LBBB like pattern? Yeah? And what is the axis? Left axis, so negative in 2, 3 and AVF. So what happened here? Tell me. Why is the QRS axis here like this? This is a combination of the last two ECGs, isn't it? Atrial sensing ventricular pacing. What kind of pacemaker can give rise to that? Will your VVI pacemaker give rise to that? VVI pacemaker is what used to be implanted for a long, long time in almost all patients. A single pacing lead in the RV apex. But will a ventricular based pacemaker, a VVI pacemaker give rise to this kind of rhythm? It cannot. It can give only this type of rhythm where it's LBBB left axis but there is no correlation between the atrium and ventricle. Since there is correlation here between the atrium and ventricle, there is coordination, there is good AV synchrony maintained. That means this has to be a type of pacemaker where there is some way of sensing what is happening in the atrium and directing the ventricle. Yes, physiological or dual chamber pacing or VDD pacing. So this patient had a dual chamber pacemaker. And the QRS axis, what does that tell you? The RV lead is likely to be at which place? Negative in, this is LBBB pattern, negative in 2, 3 AVM. Likely to be in the RV apex. Yes? Again, it's pointing towards Japan and China. So it's likely to be in the RV apex. So I showed you four ECGs. Complete heart block, wide QRS, RBBB escape. The next ECG was temporary pacing, ventricular based. There is VA dissociation, no correlation between the ventricle and the atrium. Next ECG where the AV node started conducting. It came down the right bundle, activated the ventricles and it produced a left bundle branch block. But the axis was normal. But when you have a dual chamber pacemaker in place, you are activating the RV apex, you have good AV synchrony, but the axis is leftward. Now there is also nowadays what we do is we don't necessarily implant all the pacemakers in the RV apex. We can actually put in special screw and leaves and screw it in the septum or in the RV outflow tract region. So there will be AV synchrony in these dual jumper pacemakers but the QRS axis will show LBBB pattern but not necessarily a left axis. It can show a normal axis, it can show inferior axis if I have screwed it in the RVOT, right? So the axis may change.
But this is something that you should be aware of by looking at the ECG, deciding whether there is intrinsic conduction going on or whether the temporary pacing wire is working or what is happening to the AV synchrony, you should be able to decide looking at this. Were these a good collection of ECGs, these pacing? Would you be comfortable not putting a pacemaker in a patient who has presented with syncope, complete heart block documented and on recovery shows left bundle branch block? Would you be willing to send the patient home like that? Because syncope and sudden cardiac death, these are closely related. A patient who has presented to you with syncope today, is God is giving you a chance to get to the etiology and find out what the problem is and treat it. The difference between syncope and sudden cardiac death, I keep telling repeatedly, is just that after one of these, the patient gets up. So after syncope, patient gets up. God is giving you a chance, find out the etiology and treat it. The next presentation, you'll get a telephone call from the relatives. You send the patient home yesterday, today the patient is dead. Right? So you have already documented complete heart block. You know there is infra his conduction disease. The escape rhythm is slow. This patient has presented with syncope, you've documented it. The treatment here is permanent pacemaker implantation. You cannot send home the patient without a pacemaker in these cases. Degenerative most likely. Like the vast majority. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is a little long, but it is an enjoyable journey when you are looking in retrospect. When I went through it, it was like going through hell. Okay. 33 years old gentleman. Uh, this was in January 2011. Patient is from Indore. In January 2011, the patient was incidentally detected to have PVCs. He is a uh, high-ranking executive in a bank. So during his annual checkup, ECG was done. PVCs were found in January 2011. Otherwise, the patient was normal and he did not have any problem. Looking at the PVCs, the physician decided, cardiologist decided, we should get an echo done and a holter done. So echo in, on 14 Jan, normal and LV function 60%, everything fine. Uh, nothing remarkable on the echo and the holter showed this. Uh, this is at 10.30 in the night, sinusism, PVCs, PVCs, frequent PVCs the patient is getting, right? I'll just blow it up. And then a second holter was done. So this showed episodes of non-sustained VT. Okay. Frequent PVCs, bigeminy, trigeminy, non-sustained VT lasting more than 4% of the 24 hours. Now when we look at PVCs, in again vast majority of patients we find they are RVOT morphology. LBBB like pattern, that means coming from RV. Inferior axis means coming from RVOT. That is generally the commonest place from where these PVCs come. And in the vast majority of patients we don't even treat them if they don't feel those PVCs. If they are incidentally detected, we leave them alone. These have benign prognosis, generally nothing happens to these patients. Some of these patients can have arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, RVOT, tachycardia, etc., etc. But vast majority, more than 95% of the patients, of people, I would say, not patients, 95% of people will have RVOT PVCs which are fairly benign. But this patient's story is a little different. And the Holter strip showed this. PVCs, some different morphology of PVCs. And when you look at the 24 hours, this is as per the uh, universal clock, this is at 20, 100 hours, 8 o'clock in the night. Through the night, morning, till 11 in the morning, patient has lots of premature ventricular beats, lots of PVCs. So an EP study was done in Delhi in 1st February and no inducible sustained tachycardia was produced. So generally in these patients, young person, frequent PVCs, occasional non-sustained VT, normal heart, uh, no inducible VT, patient was put on beta blockers and sent home, re reassured and sent home. So that is not a problem, this is what we do.
Uh, unfortunately, 30th March, patient was admitted with palpitations. This was the ECG which was recorded. The patient had a wide QRS tachycardia and fairly regular, isn't it? Regular wide QRS tachycardia rate is about 169 beats per minute as it shows here. LBBB like pattern, yeah, QRS and negative in V1, LBBB and almost normal axis or inferior axis, positive in 2, 3 AVF. So this is a rhythm which is wide complex tachycardia, you have to decide whether it's SVT with aberrancy or it's VT. So you are looking for what? Capture beats, fusion beats, you are trying to see if there is VA dissociation or not. And there is some suggestion, this may be a P wave here, but none here, that there may be VA dissociation, that goes in favor. And here we look at the orphan lead, the AVR, which will often tell us whether there is any VA dissociation or not. There is a P wave here, P wave here, but none out here. So there is VA dissociation. This is VT. Wide complex tachycardia, VA dissociation, ventricular tachycardia. LBBB like pattern, so coming from RV and inferior axis, so coming from what part of RV? I just told you. Right ventricular outflow tract region. So we are thinking of RV OT region. So ECG showed VT 169 beats per minute, DC cardioversion was done. This was March. Started on IV AMIO, beta blockers. And uh, then further investigation needed to be done for this patient, right? Young patient and no explainable reason why the patient should have VT. So a chest CT was done in April, multiple enlarged mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes. No obvious necrosis, highly suggestive of sarcoid. So lymph nodes with necrosis in our country, it's tuberculosis, yeah? But no necrosis, highly suggestive of sarcoid. Everybody has heard of sarcoid, I hope. Yeah. And a cardiac MRI was done, mid myocardial enhancement in basal and mid cavity of LV involving uh, a large area. Non coronary distribution. If it's a coronary distribution, we think it is blockage in the artery producing regional wall motion abnormality in artery related segments. Yeah. But this is non coronary distribution. So, non ischemic cardiomyopathy, likely sarcoidosis and by then in April EF had dropped to 31 percent. Yeah. So this patient was absolutely fine in January and you land up with severe LV dysfunction in three months on treatment for a supposedly benign kind of rhythm. So you have to be aggressive in this patient, uh, endoscopic ultrasound, bronchoscopy was done, mediastinal lymph node FNAC was done and that showed multiple epithelioid cell granulomas, lymphocytes, Langer's giant cells, background hemorrhagic, necrosis, chronic granulomatous lymphadenitis with necrosis. For sarcoid, we always do ACE levels and that was high in this patient. Proponents negative. Patient was started on AKT plus steroids. There is always confusion in our country whether it could be tuberculosis. It's better to give AKT rather than not give. We have to hit this disease aggressively. So steroids were given in addition at 30 milligrams per day. But in June, the patient had again presented with palpitations. From April to June, patient was okay on medications. Things seemed to be okay. But in June, patient presented with palpitations again. And that ECG you have in your booklet. Number five. So is it Brady or tacky? Tachycardia, it's narrow QRS or wide QRS? Irregular or regular? Regular wide QRS tachycardia in the light of what this patient already had. Uh, first tell me it's RBBB like or LBBB like pattern? RBBB like pattern which tells you it is coming from left ventricle and what is the axis now? Positive in 2-3 AVF so it's an inferior axis. So now the rhythm is coming from the left ventricle, from probably a left ventricular outflow tract region. Okay. Initial VT was RV outflow and now this is LV outflow. Is it a VT or is it something else? Why VT? You can see it here, you can see VA dissociation. There are P waves here which are distinct from the driving rhythm from the QRS. 
and you can also see a VA dissociation here. Look at the P waves, independent of the QRS. So the driving rhythm is ventricle, VA dissociation. This is coming from the LV outflow tract region. So you have two distinct regions. Okay, yeah, this is what I wanted to tell. Now this is a dictum in wide complex tachycardias. If every single QRS is not exactly congruent, that means there is possibility of VA dissociation going on underlying, underlying VA dissociation going on and that will go in favor of a VT. If it's SVT with aberrancy, each single QRS will be absolutely congruent. They will look exactly like each other. But if it's a VT, because there may be VA dissociation going on, the baseline may change, the QRS morphology may change a little. So each QRS is not exactly like the other one. So that will go in favor of a VT. So this patient was cardioverted and this was the rhythm after that. Look at what is happening to the P wave. It's biphasic and now you have a late P terminal force. So the patient has started getting left atrial enlargement and uh, spontaneously the patient had the second morphology of VT after cardioversion. This is almost like the first one that he had. So LBBB pattern, inferior axis. So in front of the eyes, patient had VT, cardioverted, second VT, cardioverted and the LVEF was by now, that is six months from the first PVC detected. LV ejection fraction 15%, grossly dilated LV, moderate MR, LA enlargement. Patient was treated then with beta blockers, lidocaine, amiodarone and uh, patient was having repeated VTs uh, but due to s compelling reasons a dual chamber ICD was implanted on 24th June and in fact I was told that there was ongoing ventricular tachycardia during the implant. Now that is generally we don't do that. If a patient is having repeated VTs or is in a ventricular tachycardia storm, the idea is to quieten things down, stabilize the patient, have a VT free interval of at least 72, 96 one hours one week before we implant a defibrillator. Because if you implant a defibrillator with ongoing VTs and VT storm, the defibrillator will try to treat all those VTs and patient will get repeated shocks. But here for some, for whatever compelling reasons, ICD was implanted, patient fortunately stabilized and discharged after five days. So everybody is a, at a little peace of mind, the family thinks okay, VTs are under control with medications, we have a safety net in place and things should be okay. But that is the only the beginning of the story. On 4th of July, patient readmitted with 12 successive shocks, had to be intubated, put on ventilator, sedated, lidocaine, IV amiodarone given and these patients in order to stabilize these rhythms, magnesium sulfate is a good medication. IV magnesium sulfate, metoprolol infusion was started and we also do something else. If the patient is getting frequent PVCs or bradycardia dependent PVCs and then VTs like in torsards then we can the every single defibrillator has an inbuilt pacemaker. So we can program the defibrillator to pace at a slightly faster rate and here the rate was 140 beats per minute in order to just quieten things down. Patient was weaned off ventilator after three days and he came to he came from Indore by flight and on the way to airplane also he had shocks. When he came to Sims, uh, he had recurrent non-sustained VT, polymorphic VT episodes. So he had QT prolongation, QTC was 520 milliseconds. It was like PVCs, R on T phenomenon, torsades and the device would shock. Underlying we checked the rhythm, what was happening when you stopped the pacing. There was severe sinus bradycardia, intermittent AV block. So the patient had been given a large amount of amiodarone beta blockers. Uh, hemodynamics were marginal, fortunately urine output maintained. Again he was intubated, put on ventilatory support. Remember the EF was 15%. Now I knew this patient was in for a long haul. These are very, very difficult patients to treat. 
so we have to be aware that this is going to be not a story of two days three days is going to be a story which is going to be two weeks four weeks so we have to prepare accordingly so right away we put a indwelling a jugular sheath triple lumen catheter police catheter we reprogrammed the pacing lidocaine amu was stopped amu was stopped for what reason qt prolongation okay and lidocaine generally doesn't work well in this subset lidocaine will work well if it is acute myocardial infarction acute ischemia polymorphic vt lidocaine will work well there but this patient this type of uh, arrhythmia non ischemic cardiomyopathy presenting with ventricular tachycardia lidocaine doesn't work very well iv mag self potassium always we need to maintain it above 4 preferably somewhere near 4.5 metoprolol infusion we had to put him on inotropics and icd reprogrammed to reduce shocks what we do is if there are ventricular tachycardia we program it in such a way that if possible we terminate those by anti tachy pacing say the vt is going at 150 beats per minute the icd will give atp will stimulate the ventricle at 170 beats per minute for 5 seconds and just stop pacing and in almost 80 percent of the cases you may be able to terminate the vt and the device then does not need to shock it will shock if required but if you are able to terminate a vt without the device having to shock it it's a very elegant way of treating vt the patient even will not come to know about it so here we are dealing with multiple things and patient is in icu and i have psyched all my registrars and everybody out that this is going to be a tough patient to treat and it was tough indeed this patient was having repeated shocks and young people they are extremely anxious they are anxious about their family about their future about their career about their work so in order to sedate him it was a tough job we were giving him fentanyl transcutaneous fentanyl patches and we exhausted the fentanyl patches of the entire country after a few days there were no fentanyl patches available everywhere anywhere in india iv morphine the last time i gave morphine was probably about 15 years ago when treating patients with acute lvs iv midazolam this was continuous infusions going on potassium was maintained more than 4.5 metoprolol infusion going on at 200 mg per day these patients because they get torsades brady dependent pvcs are on t's we give cervical sympathetic block we can inject sensor cane just near the stellate ganglion and that may reduce the chances of these arrhythmias and we started hitting the sarcoid disease as such so iv cyclophosphamide started uh, a steroid dose of 30 mg per day is grossly inadequate for these patients it gave him methyl prednisolone and then shifted him to almost 80 mg per day of prednisolone after that after 72 hours of admission the polymorphic vt is subsided so the proarrhythmic effects of amiodarone etc came down but then the patient started getting frequent monomorphic vts at least three different morphologies rates exceeding 150 blood pressure marginal frequent shocks more than 10 per day despite aggressive atp programming and after the polymorphic vts had subsided and he was getting these stable vts stable morphologically morphologically stable vts we decided to take him for ablation and uh, he was taken into the ep lab and these patients we cannot trackle with our conventional ep system the way we trackled svts uh, av node reentries or wpws or idiopathic vts these patients cannot be tackled like that here we have to use the 3d mapping system so carto biosan system is in sims it's in only one of the five or six centers in the country who have it and this arrhythmia was induced this was his rapid vt uh, vt1 so remember this vt1 this is rbbb morphology and inferior axis so you are saying it's coming from the lv outflow tract region right and at the same time the second vt was induced slightly slower lbbb pattern and inferior axis so vt2 this is coming from the rv outflow tract region and during the study three morphologies induced rbbb inferior axis around 130 lbbb inferior axis around 120 beats per minute 
and VT3 LBBB left axis or a mid left axis around 110 beats per minute localized to RV mid septum. So just looking at the ECGs you are already having a good idea of where the arrhythmia is coming from. This was his resting ECG we are doing AV sequential pacing here. So LBBB like pattern left axis AV sequential pacing we stimulate the ventricle I am doing a EP study here and his VT has started. So this is the VT RBBB morphology inferior axis this is VT1 okay during the study it accelerated to 166 beats per minute and these are my catheters I am looking at electrical signals this is my ablation catheter mapping catheter and this squiggles you see here these are electrical activities what we are looking for is trying to get the earliest activity just like you have a pond you put in a stone there are ripples coming out the electrical activity is like that you have to find where the ripples started from so when we look at this electrical conduction look we have it is critical to see get the earliest timing where the it would initiate this QRS find out where it is and we recreate the geometry of the ventricle this is the left ventricle this is the RAO view this is the LAO view this is the LV outflow tract LV apex mitral annulus so the first VT just like you said where it would be it was located in the LV outflow tract region so this is the fluoroscopic position these are the defibrillator lead RV defibrillator lead RA lead this is a bundle of his catheter this is the catheter in the right atrium and my ablation catheter is going from femoral artery aorta arch of aorta across it across the aortic valve into LV and in the LV outflow tract region just like you told me where it would be and we start ablation and the VT terminated now this is not easy for you to appreciate there's a lot of noise but take my word the VT terminated after that and patient was in sinus rhythm. But again this is not the end of story we have to make sure that all the other VTs are also ablated. So the second VT was induced and this is in the LBBB left axis pattern. So this is coming from RV and again we map this find out where it is. This is the RV geometry created. This was RV outflow tract, RV apex tricuspid annulus so just like you told me the VT2 was coming from the RV outflow tract region this is the septum here the catheter is going from IVC RA across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricular outflow tract and we ablated it here so these are the two combined pictures this is the LV picture this is the RV picture the ablation of the VT1 was here VT2 was here close to each other sarcoid disease is almost it's not segment specific like it was shown in the MRI it was across the segments so it's a myocardial disease which will affect this 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 this, this entire region so it is not cut off by IV septum or anatomical structure so the second VT this you will appreciate VT is going on RF energy started VT terminated and patient is in sinus rhythm and then we go after the third one the third morphology induced LBBB pattern and this is the leftward axis not exactly uh, left superior but leftward axis even this was tackled this is in the mid septum RV mid septum and we look at the signals find out where it is ablate and the VT terminated so three morphologies of VT in this very difficult subset of patient we found out ablated and got rid of it. We have to do it with very special technique what I showed you in five minutes it takes three hours to do. So thermocool RF ablation this ventricle is a thick structure myocardium we need to ablate a large region we use special ablation catheters and almost contiguous energies were given from LV outflow tract to RV outflow tract to RV mid septum it was band of fractionated electrograms what that means is there is disease in the electrical conduction corresponding to the basal septum scar in the MRI and after that the patient was in stable rhythm and we kept him on atrial pacing 
post procedure day one patient had three shocks now this can be the most traumatic thing of all you've done a long procedure the patient's relatives have come from across the country for this specific thing that patient will be taken there a procedure will be done and patient will be cured of the problem and we counsel the patient a lot and relatives that this is the problem not easy to treat we have to manage it differently it's not like other arrhythmias so you do a procedure tell the relatives everything was fine we ablated the rhythms nothing else is inducible after the ablation and after you take the patient in the ICU overnight if the patient gets shocks again that is extremely traumatic for the patient and it is extremely traumatic for the family it's even more traumatic for the person who is operating so <laughs> numerous non-sustained VTs present a VT3 was documented again and successively the patient had longer episodes of VT so after five days of the previous episode previous procedure the patient was taken into the EP lab again like I said this is not like your WPW syndrome you take the patient in predictable procedure you take him in 45 minutes ablation done patient is cured for life this is not that subset this is a totally different ball game this is a totally different animal we need to treat it differently so both VT2, V3, V3, VT3 were easily inducible repeat ablation performed in the RVOT region remember VT2 was coming from RVOT so LBBP pattern uh, and inferior axis and the VT3 was induced ablated v, VT2, VT3 and the patient was left behind with a right bundle branch block because VT3 was coming from the RV mid septum where the right bundle branch runs patient had residual RBBB after the ablation post ablation again no VT is inducible next four days no sustained VTs patient is fine frequent PVCs continued DDD pacing gradually reduced metaprolol maxelf continued so is this success we waited with waited uh, with held breaths next one week patient did reasonably well and he was taken off IV medications and sedation only fentanyl patch was continued like I told you there was availability problem and I think for the first time in my clinical practice of medicine and cardiology I was treating a patient for opioid withdrawal that is something I don't have any experience in patient was on morphine fentanyl and we had a tough time taking him off it even the patient's family was having a tough time so he was on a large dose of metaprolol combination of silicon excel 50 milligram 6 hourly beta lock 25 milligram 4 hourly starting at 5 am dose because these are often catecholamine surges which produce VT and the moment the patient wakes up in the morning there's a catecholamine surge and patient would start getting VTs and shocks so we started it at 5 a.m. in the morning 4 a.m. in the morning and this was along with uh, oral beta lock and non-sustained VT starting at 5 a.m. no other symptoms which would precipitate this and sure enough patient now had VT4 <laughs> okay RBBB pattern and left axis okay so RBBB like pattern where is it coming from from the left ventricle and this is a left superior axis so it's coming from the basal septum okay so LV basal septum okay see I'm taking you through a journey okay this is what we face so frequent VTs, this is three weeks post admission, frequent VTs again, frequency of ATP shocks increased, VT4, RBBB, left superior axis. And if there is VT4, there has to be VT5, LBBB, left superior axis. Now remember, where does LBBB, left superior axis come from? Right side in the apex region, RV apical region, yes? where your pacing lead is see the reason I showed you those ECGs so that you are you are able to tell me where this VT is coming from so 1st August that is 17 days 
two and a half weeks after the first procedure, patient was taken for repeat ablation. So this is our fluoroscopy and our conventional EP system you all have seen. But this is what we create during the CARTO 3D mapping. And here I have taken them in. We induce this fourth VT localized to the left inferior septum. VT5 localized to RV inferior septum. In fact, it was corresponding to the RV aspect of the VT5 location. It was as if this is the IV septum. One VT is coming from here, other is coming from here. It's probably the same region where the electrical problem is and it is exiting somewhere, sometimes from the LV, sometimes from the RV. And extensive ablation again performed. Uh, this patient had a dilated LV, the muscles had thinned out. IV septum was barely 3 millimeters. So when I was ablating, I was scared I might just go through the IV septum and create an artificial VSD. So between a rock and a hard place trying to take care of this problem. So this was the VT4 RBBB left superior axis, VT5 LBBB left superior axis and during ablation one VT terminated, second started. Can you see this? This is a very daunting arrhythmias that we are managing. This was in the LV inferior septum. Uh, catheter going across the aorta into the LV inferior septum region. Again, biosense catheter, this is where it was located. And the second one was in the RV. So RV, RV inferior septum. VT3. So here you have a combination of what all I have done for this patient. This is the left ventricle, LAO view. This is the right ventricle. VT1 was in the LV outflow tract. VT2 in the RV outflow tract. VT3 in the RV mid septum. VT4 in the LV inferior septum. VT5 in the RV apex, apex and inferior septum. And this is continuous disease in the entire myocardium. And we ablated almost everywhere. And patient was post ablation. Again, this time we had a we learned the lesson, we kept him deeply sedated for 72 hours because the moment he would wake up, he would ask, is the ablation successful? Are my VTs gone? And I didn't have the heart to tell him, I am not very sure. It is successful till now, but what will happen tomorrow, I don't know. So gradual weaning of sedation thereafter. Next two weeks, patient had frequent PVCs, occasional non-sustained VTs, rate maximum to 140, but no shocks. Remember he was on azathioprine, steroids and he had candidal esophagitis. We were uh, wondering whether there is sarcoid infiltration. We got OGD scopy done and uh, treated him thereafter for that. It was candidal esophagitis. So this is 70 days post admission. Patient is in ICU. He has not come out of the ICU. Fortunately in SIMS we have ICUs which are built around central atria. There is a lot of sunlight coming in. Patient can see the sun. They know when morning is. They know when night is. So they don't get ICU psychosis, which you get in a lot of other places. In a lot of other hospitals, the ICUs are like boxed uh, rectangles, cuboids, where you don't know whether it's morning or evening or what is happening. And patients go crazy in that. Here at least he was aware of uh, what, is, uh, what else is going on. Seeing the sun itself is therapeutic for a lot of patients especially the older patients and I'm sure you all have enough clinical experience to know that and uh, uh, yeah so for 70 days he was in the ICU no shocks for six weeks following the third procedure for this patient ATP four occasions for VTs which were fairly slow and echo LV function 15% so now is the time where I needed to decide what to do. Should we go after these VTs or wait and watch? Should I discharge? The problem here is if I discharge him, he goes back to Indore, something happens, he cannot rush back to Ahmedabad. And it is very difficult for the family to understand what to do in these patients. So throughout this 70 days course, I was all the time in consult with Dr. Amit Vora, Amit had actually come down to Ahmedabad for some other reason for our meeting. I got him to SIMS to get an objective opinion of what I am doing, whether I am doing it right or not, whether I am on the right track or not.
and a couple of other colleagues are always on the phone to decide. I think this patient was known all over the country and a lot of places around the world. They knew about what was happening to this patient. And the treatment that he was on, look at this, look at the combination, metoprolol, 200 per day. He was restarted on amidoron later, but a very minimal dose. I had put him on sotolol, I thought it was not working well for him, discontinued. Ranolazine is an anti-ischemic drug, but it has certain properties which are anti-arrhythmic also. So I was using ranolazine for this patient. He was on lenoxin, ramipril, epilenolone, spironolactone. His potassium just would not go above 4, whatever I tried. We were giving him epilenolone, spironolactone, potlor and magnesium, azathioprine, steroids and supportive and symptomatic medications. Finally, when he was discharged, that was day 76, that is two and a half months of ICU stay for a very critical problem. They stayed in a rented apartment for a couple of weeks. I kept seeing him twice a week. He had steroid facies, thigh muscle weakness following steroids. Uh, LV function was still around 50%. This is the patient and this is our team. You can see the sun is coming in. <laughs> And uh, this is the father, patient's wife. If it had not been for her, this patient would not have made it through a week of what he went through. She was the strongest person to face all adversities and she was giving strength to this, to this patient. Without her, nothing would have been possible. And uh, through the device then we, uh, when we interrogate, you can see here, it gives us an entire snapshot of what has happened over the last few weeks or months. From July to November, that is when uh, this was taken. Initially, this is all ventricular tachycardia. This is a two month timeline which is compressed here. So, VT, 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 more than five episodes per day. And after September, there are virtually nil. This was one episode here, but you can see the tracing is there. So, this is a cardiac compass report which we get from the defibrillator. It gives us a snapshot of what the arrhythmia has been, what the defibrillator has been doing. And these are non-sustained VT episodes. So again, lots of non-sustained VTs initially and then towards the end, very, very few. Uh, Post-discharge, he came for follow-up, steroids were being tapered, LV function gradually improved. No VT VF shocks for more than 8 weeks. Patient flew back to Indore for Diwali. He was following up with his cardiologist doing well. I just received, I keep getting periodic SMSs every couple of weeks. He's doing well and he's resumed work. So very, very difficult problem, but this is what we take care of almost once a month. These patients come in from all over Western India and we need to take care of these issues. And unless we have a team like we have in SIMS, the intensivists, the medical officer, the staff, the environment and ability to create protocols and making everybody follow them to the core. Without this, treating this type of patient, it's impossible. These patients will not make it through a week. But 76 days staying in ICU, uh, this patient survived. And uh, what we learned from how to manage VT storm by a lot of sedation, judiciously chosen time for ablation. Problems of opioid sedation and withdrawal, need for repeated ablation with specialized systems. Chemotherapy and steroids, infection and ancillary care. Need to determine at what point of time we should say, okay, let's just wait and watch. And always, always difficult cases, get objective opinions from your friends, from colleagues, from other experts. Fortunately for uh, us, electrophysiologists, it's a small community in the country. There are barely 20, 25 people. All are excellent friends. We communicate all the time. And if there are any problems, we uh, talk with each other. Each one of us has had some experience which uh, always helps in the input, and uh, which uh, they help with the input. And uh, we have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do. Why don't you suggest something? So that helps a lot. Thank you.
Let us start. 51 year old gentleman coming to the hospital with the chief complaint cigarette just fell out from her mouth. Been investigated and diagnosed with a stroke, uh, and which is involving one of the major internal carotid artery. Uh, so the treatment option for him either it's a medical therapy, uh, aspirin, plevix, statins, uh, risk factor modification, surgery that is carotid and atrectomy, or go for the carotid artery stenting. Uh, let us discuss about the CEA that is carotid and atrectomy. Brief introduction been done first in 1952 by the great surgeon Dr. Debecky, uh, in Saint Mary Hospital. Uh, in 1952, the major randomized trials for this uh, end atrotomy has been started only after 1980s because the first publication was been done in 1975. Uh, brief discussion about uh, the CEA, uh, either can be done under GA or LA with the sedation. It is a standard neckline incision uh, in the neck, uh, isolating, looping, and a clamping of the internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, and common carotid artery. This, uh, skin uh, this um, incision over the common carotid and the co internal carotid uh, removal of the plaque and close in the layer bit of a complications uh, mainly mi stroke and uh, uh, minor complications uh, ranging from 0.5 to 3 percent mortality majority of uh, having a mi and a stroke which range from 0.25 to 3 uh, percent minor complications including nerve injury bleeding infection and level blood pressure now coming to the trials actually, uh, as I discussed before the trials has been started from 1980s and uh, mid 90s. Uh, the stands are not dead at a time, so major trials was been carried out uh, between the carotid uh, and atrotomy, the surgery and the um, medicines. Uh, the group been divided in the symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, uh, a lot of trials actually, we don't have time to discuss everything, but uh, just going to the major trial that is NASCAT, uh, randomized trial in the 50 centers of the US and Canada. The conclusion, yeah, so the conclusion, this uh, surgery is recommended for the any symptomatic patients uh, which is having a critical, uh, critical stenosis. Uh, uh, this is AKS trial uh, between the asymptomatic patient, again the randomized trial carried out in uh, USA and Canada between 1988 to 1993, uh, not going into details, but conclusion, CA is again recommended for the patients with the more than 60% stenosis uh, with good facilities uh, for the surgical setup. Uh, summarizing all trials, uh, grading stenosis, either high, intermediate or low, symptomatic patient, uh, CA is the treatment of choice, intermediate uh, group, uh, either CEA, uh, if patient is not falling in uh, the high risk group uh, or medical management, uh, if other around. In the low uh, stenosis, uh, low grade stenosis, uh, uh, certainly medicines. In asymptomatic medicines, again uh, surgery, that is uh, if the risk is less than 3%, then otherwise medicine, same thing in the intermediate group and in the low uh, grade stenosis, uh, surgery, uh, sorry, medicine is the treatment of uh, choice. Um, the same thing, if it is a critical stenosis, uh, stenosis symptomatic patients, uh, then surgery is the treatment of uh, choice uh, in all patients. If it is uh, intermediate, uh, as I discussed, uh, if it is uh, symptomatic, uh, then surgery. In low-grade stenosis, asymptomatic patients, surgery is not indicated. Uh, there are a few group of patients uh, which have been excluded from um, the surgery. These are the high-risk uh, actually patients and which uh, not recommended. It's complete occlusion, uh, everyone knows. Severe comorbidity, like uh, you know, previous MI, uh, severe LV dysfunction, heart failure, or uh, severe uh, COPD. Previous stroke associated with dense persistent neurological deficit, uh, which are not going to be benefited with the surgery. And symptomatic patients with hemorrhagic uh, component, because the surgery can exaggerate uh, the bleeding because of the reperfusion. Now, this all the trials was been done before the stent era, and it was between mainly the surgery and the medicines. Uh, stents has been introduced since last uh, few years, and after that, a uh, lot of trials has been started between the stents and the surgery. Again, a lot of trials uh, in a lot of people, a lot of uh, group of uh, uh, things like symptomatic, asymptomatic, uh, elderly patient, young patient, uh, etc. Main one, this uh, ICSS, this is uh, trial, was been carried out uh, between the one around uh, 1700 patients uh, results basically it is uh, very much uh, prominent uh, stroke mi or death at the end of the 120 days in uh, coronary artery stenting group uh, is much more higher than the surgical group stroke mi and death uh, per protocol 
is the same one. If you uh, divide everything, like you know, any stroke, which is also higher, insidious MI is nearly equal, you know, in uh, both groups. Non-stroke and non-MI deaths, which are slightly higher in the coronary artery stenting group. Among the stroke, the fatal stroke is significantly high in the stenting group. Uh, disabling stroke is somewhat equal or slightly higher in the surgical group, and non-disabling stroke is quite high in the stenting group. Um, this is the same chart actually, uh, not going into detail for that. This is the major trial was been carried out actually you know, uh, recently and has been recently published. Uh, Multi-center randomized trial comparing the surgery and stenting uh, between um, the various centers actually. A lot of criteria about inclusion and exclusion, again not I'm going for the details. Results actually were favoring the both are treatment is same, but the stroke incidence was slightly higher on the uh, stenting group, while MI rate was slightly higher, you know, in the surgical group. Uh, otherwise, the ratio of the figures were quite um, um, similar in uh, both of the group. So people took it as like, you know, the coronary artery stenting is uh, equivalent to coronary artery uh, carotid anatectomy, but it is not actually. Though incidence of MI was higher in CEA group, all the patients recovered well than the higher stroke patient in coronary artery stenting group, with they had a greater impact on their life quality. Long-term results of CREST is still awaiting. It's only four-year results has been published right now. Okay, and the long-term results are till you know under uh, way. And elderly patients were being excluded because of increased mortality and morbidity which other trials has clearly shown that uh, in elderly patient, uh, surgery is uh, very much uh, superior than stenting. Uh, same thing, trials have conveniently shown that on average, carotid surgeons uh, do better revascularization. Very important slide. This is the meta-analysis has been released in uh, uh, endovascular uh, journal in August 2011. This, they con included each and every trial has been carried out till now. And the results were quite striking. Uh, the relative risk, they counted as relative risk as a 30-day stroke and a long-term risk of stroke and uh, restenosis and death. So RR was 30 days uh, for the stroke uh, was significantly high, you know, 1.6 times than the CEA group. 30-day uh, relative risk of stroke and death was 1.5 times higher in the stenting group. There was a high risk of uh, long-term uh, uh, stroke. The risk of restenosis was almost twice in a stenting group than the surgical group. So the conclusion was 30-day uh, relative risk of stroke, stroke uh, death, long-term stroke uh, uh, impact, and the risk of restenosis are significantly higher for the carotid artery stenting group. Uh, again, uh, not going into details. Um, Quite good thing actually. When you can't do it is safely. It's pretty clear that uh, you don't have similarity. Good question. Why the cardiologists are interested in carotids? Uh, this is the answer. Finally, concluding, CE is preferable over the car uh, carotid artery stenting. The first risk of a periprocedural stroke in symptomatic patient is certainly lower than the stenting group. There are a lot of data available. I have a whole bunch of papers in my hand, which none of the paper is showing that C, that stenting is superior to the surgery. Cost in India is almost half, actually. You know, just uh, in uh, uh, almost center. Very important thing, stenting needs high expertise, actually. It's a new treatment, actually, stenting. And um, end after surgery is quite old, so all centers, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, and Neurosurgeons, they do this uh, surgery, but till stenting needs high expertise, which means either SIMS or acid by. Better pre-op evaluation has reduced the complication rate nowadays, actually. That is including MI. And the anesthesia technique uh, is quite much safer nowadays, uh, and because of the complications um, can be downgraded because of that. Uh, I'll just stop here. So stenting and carotid disease, the important question is why did carotid stenting start almost 20 years ago? And we just heard that the first carotid endotrectomy was done in 1953. And imagine that 
there were just three trials done from 1953 to 1990 because surgery was the only thing available and the surgeons didn't take upon themselves to say whether they were doing a good job or not. The NASA trial that we just heard about, uh, it had a lot of things, but this is the exclusion criteria of, there were two trials, NASA and ACAS. NASA was a symptomatic patient population and the ACAS was asymptomatic population. And look at the exclusion criteria that they had. And that is the reason why carotid stenting came, because the excluded patients with renal failure, pulmonary failure, liver failure, atrial fibrillation, valvular heart disease, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, the list goes on and on, that this uh, set of patients were never even considered for surgery. That is the data that they were showing us. The carotid endotrachmy, anatomical challenges that they had, high lesions, carotid uh, endotrachmy restenosis was a higher risk, contralateral occlusion, uh, conditions that uh, create spinal and neck immobility, so long list of exclusion criteria, Medical challenges, these were all excluded. So only a s very selected subset population was taken for the trial. And look at the results. What we are talking about, 30-day results. 30-day results for medical treatment was better than surgery in their trials, both the trials. The 30-day mortality was 3.3% for medicine, medical treatment versus 5.5% for endotrachmy. At two years in the symptomatic population, surgery was far better, and that is the reason. Now, these days we talk about even the CREST trial, and I'll show you the data. We are talking about 30-day result. So medical treatment has a role in this whole paradigm of uh, treating carotid stenosis, uh, which we are not talking about today. ACAS results, 30-day results. Medical treatment was better than surgery. Okay, so you've got to put that in perspective. NASA surgical complications. Uh, we are talking about uh, mod, uh, three things, mortality, strokes, and myocardial infarction. But look at the morbidity. Morbidity is very high uh, with surgery, so one has to keep that in mind. Because you're dead, you're dead, but if you're suffering throughout the rest of your life, that is a major problem. Uh, so carotid endotrachmy definitely has been the gold standard and is still the gold standard, so I'm not going to take that away. Uh, but it has advantages and disadvantages, and you can read for yourselves what the advantages and disadvantages are. And similarly, carotid artery stenting has advantages and disadvantages, so nothing is perfect. Uh, so what was the premise of carotid stenting? The goals that the, we were uh, set for were in symptomatic patients, complication rate should be less than 6%, and in asymptomatic patient, it should be less than 3%. So the trials were set with this, these premises, and all the surgical trials till date were high risk, uh, were low surgical risk patients, whereas all the carotid artery stent trials were the high surgical risk patients. So the lower surgical risks were excluded in the carotid artery stent trials. So the procedure is basically, this is an embolic prediction device, which we put in before we put the stent in, and this has revolutionized carotid stenting. Uh, I was gonna show this uh, procedure, and I don't know whether I have time, I'm gonna go through this fast. If this ever plays. Carotid stenting is not as bad as this video. Oh, I'm going to skip that. So there have been many trials on carotid stenting since 1990 when the procedure came in. And you can see that the major stroke is less than 3% in all these trials. Uh, the, high, uh, the composite endpoint of these uh, complications is started with 8.3% and we are in the range of 3.8% as the technology is evolved. The TLR, that, that is restenosis, is very low. Whereas the high risk population trials for endotrachmy, all these are very small trials, and you can see the complication rates were much higher. They were double digits in all of these trials. The, subsequently in, in 2004, a small study compared the endotrachmy with stenting, and what we saw was that carotid endotrachmy at one year primary endpoint 
was less uh, better than stenting, and this was a, a statistical difference. Uh, you could understand that this was at one year endpoint. Uh, primary endpoint in 360 days, endotrachmy versus stent, strokes, uh, uh, major strokes were higher with, stent, uh, with endotrachmy at one year, uh, lower with stenting. Restenosis was again lower with stenting compared to endotrachmy at one year, uh, and remained such at two years. So this was a, a, a real world trials for just stenting. This is not a, a, a randomized trial. And it shows that uh, all stroke and death and major stroke and death are pretty low with stenting. This is my own data. It's a single center, single operator experience of 250 odd patients over the last five years. And I believe in my own data. If I can produce it, so can others. That is how, what I believe in. And my success rate has been 99%. Acute complication rate has been 1.1%. Hospital stays one to three days. And the restenosis, uh, TLR is 0.3%. And this is real data with all patients being in trial. So where we come to is today for symptomatic standard risk patients is revascularization superior to medical treatment alone. This was shown by the uh, surgical data that uh, uh, NASEB uh, ECST European study that the surgery was better than medicine over time. Asymptomatic population, again, the ACAST data showed that surgery was better than medical treatment over time. And for symptomatic high-risk patients, at least carotid stenting is equal, if not better, to stenting. Uh, uh, carotid stenting is better than endotrachmy. What we didn't know was the symptomatic standard risk patients and the CREST trial, SPACE, and EVA, there are three trials that have been published now. And the asymptomatic, there is CREST data, but there is not ACT-1 data yet. So these are the randomized trials that exist. And what I want to share is uh, the SPACE trial. This was a European trial where embolic protection devices were not used, and it showed that there was no difference in endpoints. That is when we didn't have the best procedure possible showed recurrent strokes at two years, there was no difference between surgery and, endotric, uh, surgery and stenting. EVA3S was a trial out of Europe again, had a lot of issues. The CREST trial, which was just mentioned, uh, basically showed that there's no difference between endotrachmy and stenting in both symptomatic and asymptomatic populations at 30 days. Uh, up to four years of follow-up with major endpoints, there has been no difference between the two procedures. Cranial nerve injury was more with endotrachmy, and there are other caveats from this study, which I think are going to be presented tomorrow by Dr. Simonton. The physical and mental components were better with stenting in the CREST trial. That is, eating, swallowing, driving, headaches, neck pain, hematoma were far better with stenting than surgery. Walking and leg pain were slightly better with endotrachmy. ACT trial is not out there. This is a patient that I just did about a month ago, and the endotrachmy on this patient was done in 2008, and you can see that pretty good results and has stayed open for the last three years. The same patient, the stenting was done in 2008 on the right side and has stayed open for the last three years and looks pretty good. So same patient, left side endotrachmy, right side surgery, 2008, both the procedures, and has stayed open. But look at this. This is what a surgery slide looks like. This is what a stenting slide looks like. Nice clean slide, nice clean procedure, no incisions, no cuts, uh, no hematomas there, and the surgery is a mess. So my message to my friend here is that we have two good procedures. We just have to give the choice to the patients for most of them, but there are certain subset of patients which will benefit from stenting, and there are certain subset of patients which will require surgery. So I don't think so. There's a win, and, win or lose situation here. I think the patient wins with either of the two procedures when they're done for the right reasons. Thank you.
Now the conclusion from Asit Bhai, like as I already said, you know, stenting needs expertise. And so you guys have only two choices. Either come to Sims to Kevur Bhai or Milan Bhai or go to America. That's it. Uh, I have the, I already told, I have all the bunch of papers which all trials what he said and which is clearly, you know, telling that till this time, till this date, carotid and atrotomy is quite superior than the standing. I don't know, Asit Bhai, he tried to convince, uh, you know, he showed some uh, surgical picture, some blood, you know, some scar and all these things, but I don't know, all these things are minor things. When you have a less chances of a stroke with the surgery, uh, just a few sec. But um, I appreciate actually the things are fine and uh, he is uh, right. Uh, we have now algorithm uh, which is. Uh, 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 which is now clearly defining the role of uh, surgery and uh, standing. Uh, if symptomatic patient uh, with a high degree of a stenosis, if low risk, uh, risk means uh, basically what uh, uh, we mentioned, like uh, you know, uh, previous MI or failure uh, or COPD, they should offer a surgery. If the high falling the high risk, they should offer uh, standing. If it is less than 50 percent, medical management has been accepted worldwide. In asymptomatic patient, this is the bigger topic to debate actually. If it is uh, the stenosis is low grade, uh, then certainly medical management. But if it is a high grade, then again, if in the low risk patient, we can still offer the surgery, uh, which uh, is uh, showing some good results. If the patient is falling in the high risk, uh, again, the stenting is an option. Uh, uh, one more thing I just want to say. Yes, uh, So these are the pros and cons actually for the carotid and atrophy and uh, stenting. Uh, again, you know, risk of uh, periprocedural stroke uh, is uh, certainly less uh, in uh, endotrophy group. Uh, more data is available. What Asit Bhai he just uh, saw before the NASCAT and AKS trials because the stents were not that time. So you know they, they don't have any choice actually. So data is according to me is okay. It is not perfect. I believe I agree with him. Cost in India, this is the very important thing. Actually, you know, if if even for the bypass surgery, if I tell patient it costs you know 125,000 bucks, you know, then they think for twice. Okay, so here the standing with emboli protection device, which itself costing 50,000 bucks, uh, certainly uh, very few people uh, afford that. Again, you know, there are little bit risk factors uh, like what he said, wound infection, and uh, you know, a little bit of uh, nerve injury, uh, bleeding. Now, for any surgery, these things are inevitable, and so you know, for the accounting of all these things, uh, maybe, uh, as I said, uh, surgery is a better option. I think the point that it makes is that uh, we have two good procedures, and if done properly, uh, I think the patient would benefit from both the procedures done in the right situation. My take to the surgeons is, my message to the surgeons is, that before they don't have anything else to do, the vascular surgeons, because this is the only field that they have left. They've lost the lower extremities, they've lost the renals, they've lost, they're losing the AAA to the uh, stent grafting. This is the only area left, and I pity you guys, but I, what my advice to you is, go there, train yourself to do stenting, because stenting is there, and it will grow. So be part of it, rather than fight it. Thank you. A famous sentence by Abraham Lincoln, it has long been recognized that problems with alcohol relate not to the use of a bad thing, but to the abuse of a good thing. And this is unfortunately human beings are quite capable of. So alcohol is not only good for health, it is extremely good for health. And of course, there is no question, 44 ml of scotch or whiskey or 148 ml of wine or 355 ml of beer, they all contain same alcohol, though the quantity and color value may be different. Factors which determine the effects of alcohol on an individual is how much is consumed, rate of consumption, what is in stomach, presence of carbonation, mood status and gender. And a very important point when we discuss about alcohol, without this slide I cannot go forward, one needs to understand what is a responsible drinker. Limit number of drinks, take slowly, sleep slowly, one drink per 90 minutes, eat lots of proteins and starch, avoid carbonated drinks, measure drinks carefully and don't drive when it is intoxicated. 
So my idea in next 8 or 10 minutes is, number one, to discuss the possible benefits and risk of alcohol and the threshold of intake at which alcohol becomes a health danger rather than an advantage, to highlight mechanisms by which alcohol confers cardio protection and life protection, to discuss very interesting ideal quantities, drinking patterns and beverages and which individuals are most likely to benefit and then let the house decide what is good for them. The data that alcohol is good for cardiovascular health is quite old. It was first very well publicized in 1926 by Raymond Paul. He did a lot of research and work on this. But that was a time which was a prohibition time and that was, that's why it was largely ignored. So today in Gujarat it is prohibition time. So we may not have value of this talk, but maybe after 20 years story may be different. In 1931 in NEGM a beautiful statement came by Timothy Leary. My personal experience has indicated alcohol was not only not a cause of atherosclerosis, but so far as one could judge, was in many cases a preventive measure. So let me put a lot of data. Number one, Jack, light to moderate alcohol consumption and mortality in the Physician's Health Study Enrollment Cohort. These were 90,000 people who were free of disease at the baseline, 89.2, free of non-myocardial infarction, stroke, cancer, and liver disease at baseline. And what was found is there is U-shaped relation between alcohol consumption and total mortality among those who used to take light to moderate drinks. And this is the data. Look at the total mortality, those who took two to six drinks a week, that is roughly one to two drinks a day, the total mortality was less, CV mortality was less, it was less further when drink was little higher, cancer mortality was less when there was moderate drinking and overall mortality was also less. Another data, a beautiful article, Alcohol and Cardiovascular Mortality, Common Sense and Scientific Truth by Klatsky MD, 1,27,000 people between 1978 to 1985. Look at those who never took any kind of alcohol and look at the CV deaths and non-CV deaths. As compared to those who are absolutely non-drinkers or abstainers, those who used to take less than one drink a day or two, one to two drinks a day, cardiovascular mortality is significantly less as well as total mortality is also less. Moderate alcohol consumption improves mortality in nine years of follow-up, five lakh subjects published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1997. When you take alcohol at a moderate dose, all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortalities are tremendously reduced. A very important state-of-the-art paper published in JEC quite recently, Alcohol and Cardiovascular Health, the razor sharp double-edged sword, that's really true. Light to moderate alcohol consumption, up to one drink daily for women and one to two drinks daily for men is associated with cardioprotective benefits. And this cardiovascular protection is predominantly through improvement in insulin sensitivity and high density lipoprotein. Low dose daily alcohol is associated with better health than those who do not drink or those who drink as a binge drink. Let's see what did he mention in this beautiful article. Look at the alcohol and all cause mortality, my dear friend Urmil Shah. This is very important for you to look at here. Men and women, those who take less than one peg, the cardiovascular mortality is less. Men who take one to two pegs, cardiovascular mortality is less. My dear friend may say that alcohol can lead to acute MI. No, dear friend, alcohol intake and risk of MI in men who are following healthy lifestyle. Those who take 15 to 30 gram alcohol per day, risk of acute MI was much less as compared to those who did not take it. What about brain and stroke? Those who take two to three drinks per day, stroke is definitely less as compared to those who do not take it. We all have discussed today, coronary calcification on CT scan is very likely prediction of cardiovascular mortality. When you take one to two drinks per day, your chance of having extensive calcification on CT scan is much reduced as compared to those who do not take. So it helps there also. A very important point, we consider CRP as a marker of inflammation and atherosclerosis. Those who take five to seven drinks a week, the CRP level is less as compared to those who do not take it. So all surrogate endpoints and all heart events are reduced. What about glucose? My friend may say that alcohol increases glucose. No. Those who take wine with milk, postprandial blood sugar is less as compared to those who do not take wine with the milk. What about new onset of diabetes? Those who take 10 to 30 grams of alcohol per day on a regular basis, new onset of diabetes chance is much less. So less risk of diabetes, those who take alcohol on a regular basis. My friend may ask me, these are all data on healthy people. What about the people who have cardiovascular disease? Look at the meta-analysis published in JEC, eight studies, 16,000 patients. They all were patients of cardiovascular disease. And what was the conclusion? In patients with cardiovascular disease, light to moderate alcohol consumption, that is 5 to 25 grams per day, was significantly associated with lower incidence of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. Not only cardiovascular, but all-cause mortality. My friend may say that alcohol leads to LV dysfunction and heart failure. Let us see what it does in people with established left ventricular systolic dysfunction. This was a data from Seoul trial, 2,500 2, people who used to have moderate drinking, 3,700 people no drinking at all, ejection fraction less than 35. 
It was not associated with any adverse prognosis, rather risk of fatal MI was reduced in those people who had LLV dysfunction and used to take regular moderate alcohol. What about benefit of alcohol in people with diabetes? This was a data extracted from nurses health study as well as professionals follow up study. The benefits of moderate drinking is there in people with diabetes. Moderate alcohol consumption is associated with lower risk of CHD in men with type 2 diabetes. And look at here, people who are non-diabetics, those who take half to two drinks a day, the risk of cardiovascular event is less. People who are diabetics, those who take roughly one to two drinks a day, cardiovascular disease and mortality is less. What should be the drinking pattern to minimize the risk of heart attack? It's very, very important. Look at here. Those who drink three to seven pegs or drinks a week and roughly almost on all days up to 30 gram, the benefit is maximum. So the way of drinking is one to two pegs for men almost on daily basis. The drinking pattern has an influence on prognosis and that was again very well documented in British Medical Journal. What they compared is binge drinking versus regular moderate drinking. Regular and moderate alcohol intake throughout the week. The typical pattern in middle-aged men in France is associated with a low risk of ischemic heart disease, whereas the binge drinking pattern more prevalent in Belfast confers a higher risk. So it's very important one has to be moderate drinker on a regular basis. Is red wine better than other products? No. There are a lot of data that it is the ethanol content, whatever the drink may be, which is more important and not the phenolic component of red wine. What about beverage type and risk of MI? Talking the story, same story. Red wine, white wine, beer and liquor. Whatever you drink, it should be 15 to 30 gram almost on all days. That is what is helping, not a specific product. A very, again, beautiful state-of-the-art paper, Alcohol and Cardiovascular System, produce research challenges and opportunities by Lucas. What did he mention is, when you take moderate drinking, that is 15 gram per day for women, 15 to 30 gram day for men, it leads to a lot of beneficial changes. It improves HDL cholesterol, reduces LDL cholesterol oxidation, improves insulin sensitivity, reduces clotting and platelet aggregation, increase fibrinolysis, reduce homocysteine, reduce CRB, and these are all the ways by which alcohol is going to help. All such benefits were confirmed in circulation articles. See, there are all articles, Jack, NEGM, circulation, BMJ, huge data. In fact, when I search alcohol and health problems, no journal, there was zero result. I went to a lot of medical sites, alcohol and health hazard. When moderate drinking is there, there is no hazard documented by any medical journal so far. What did circulation people check is drinking frequency, mediating biomarkers and risk of MI. So that is, they confirmed it is insulin sensitivity and HDL cholesterol which helps there. Going back to old story, Hippocrates, what did he say in his initial statement? Wine is vital to a healthy diet. So it's a compulsory, necessary part of a healthy diet. But a very important point is whether wine is a nourishment, medicine or poison is a matter of doses. And this is where we have to be very careful. So ladies and gentlemen, coming to conclusion number one, which is very important, which is the debate is whether alcohol is good for health, no doubt. There is no doubt whatsoever data available on this earth that alcohol is useful to health. There are two, three things to that. Number one, data suggests that alcohol consumption, like exercise, is most cardioprotective when done daily in moderation. This is a condition. It is tempting to recommend a small daily dose of alcohol to middle-aged or elderly men and postmenopausal women, particularly who do not have family or personal history of substance abuse, who do not have depression or bipolar disorders, and those who are non-smokers. It is quite tempting based on data. So alcohol is extremely helpful for health. That's proven by observational studies. But part two of my conclusion is at the moment, I am not in a state or condition to recommend it to everybody because of three things. Number one, we need randomized controlled trials for alcohol as far as its impact on cardiovascular health and mortality is concerned. Before that, as a scientific person, I can't recommend to everybody. A very important point is moderate daily drinking is a slippery slope that many individuals cannot safely navigate and that's a real problem. And we as a fraternity need to define tools for predicting susceptibility to problem drinking. There are certain genes now people have found out if you possess that gene, your chances to become a problem drinker is high. Those are the people who should never be promoted for alcohol. But there are people with certain healthy genes which if we tell them one to two pegs a day will help your life and they can keep on that. So it's very, very important to decide on alcohol at today. Thank you very much for your time. You really have to understand that uh, and then make a conclusion. Uh, disclosure, nothing to disclose, no conflict of interest. Uh, health is WHO defined. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely an absence of disease. That is the WHO recommendation of health. This is the US government warning, specifically telling that pregnant women should not take, if you are taking, driving a car, operating machineries, should can cause a health problem, so it should be avoided. This is a regulatory authority where there is a warning labels 
and alcohol warnings where it is sold in the shops where it is available. Now this is 2012 and you have to remember, if you don't remember anything else, remember the 12 risk of alcohol, anemia, cancer, cardiovascular disease, cirrhosis, dementia, depression, seizure, gout, high blood pressure, infectious, nerve damage and pancreatitis. This is the warning, it may cause death, poisoning, cancer, injury and addiction. Uh, uh, this, is, this is how the alcohol is being produced. It is the yeast, uh, feeds the feed on a sugar uh, in absence of oxygen and which releases the carbon dioxide and ultimately ethanol is produced. The disadvantage it loses water from the body, it affects the deprive the nerve ending and uh, brain to shrink and that is the reason why all sorts of problem is occurring. Dehydration is an important thing, diuretic, it gives brain uh, cells to shrink and that is the reason all sorts of problem is occurring. Uh, as I have told, the magnesium potassium is being reduced, it will lead to cardiac uh, arrhythmia and can lead to sudden cardiac death. Glucose is excreted, so next day patient person will be uh, yawning in his uh, working time. This is what the WHO has shown, it is the alcohol use where there is significant high. If we just look at it, the uh, daily adverse event is significantly high, that is the third place after uh, childhood and unsafe sex. This is the problems of alcohol, as you can see here, liver cirrhosis, unintentional injury, cancer, intestinal uh, problems and cardiovascular problems also. Uh, alcohol may be the man's worst enemy, but the Bible says you love, you love your enemy. Alcohol and related arm, homicide, suicide, domestic violence, sexual assault, unprotected sex, vehicle accident, drowning, burns, peptical disorder, cirrhosis, all sorts of hypertension, hemorrhagic stroke, which I will go into detail, atrial fibrillation, sudden cardiac death, dilated cardiomyopathy, cancers of mouth, gastritis, fetal alcohol syndrome in a pregnancy, mental illness and alcohol dependence syndrome. Social problems, unemployment, families, homelessness and economic costs also is involved. When I read uh, about alcohol's evil, I stop, I gave up reading. That is what normally one does. Uh, you can see here very clearly hypertension, ischemic stroke and the hemorrhagic stroke. You can see that everywhere uh, here, as you can see here, it is the very low dose where the ischemic stroke is reduced. Hypertension is gradually increasing even someone is consuming less amount of alcohol. Hemorrhagic stroke also is increasing even with the smallest dose of alcohol. Atrial fibrillation, there is no relation like J-shape which has been shown. There is a clear cut increase whatever dose you are taking. Alcoholic cardiopathy, the worst part of it, it's a prognosis is not good if this is happening and mo many of the patients cannot stop alcohol after having alcohol cardiomyopathy and that is the reason why they have very worse outcome. This is a very interesting, the HDL is raised some of the benefit of alcohol. As you can see, the benefit if you take one or two drinks is about five to 10%. If someone is taking niacin, I mean HDL, then if someone is taking niacin, then definitely the HDL can go up to this much high. So there is no need to take alcohol to increase your HDL level. CRP, very interesting, CRP is reduced. But the important thing we have to understand is this is the study where clearly it was mentioned that those patients who are on provostatin or the atrovastatin arm, there was no benefit. So person who is already on statin, CRP reduction is not there if he is consuming alcohol. Second important thing is CRP is 37% reduction with rosuvastatin, which has so many other benefits and no disadvantage. Why not to take that instead of alcohol? This is interesting, alcohol, the slate same side has been shown, but the important thing is here, healthy lifestyle. Now you have to have a healthy lifestyle to get a benefit of alcohol and we all know that there are so many other problems with the alcohol. Female, last several years, 1715-1, fetal alcohol syndrome, the incidence is increasing, breast cancer also is increasing, alcohol and liver disease, definitely there is a very high cirrhosis and uh, liver cancer. As you can see, colorectal cancer, liver, everything is high and most of the cancers, we say about 20 to 30 percent, has been straight away correlated to the alcohol. This is the pattern of drinking. We all know this is in the Western population. We don't know about the Indian population. But definitely those persons who are having light to moderate otherwise, they are likely to have intermittent binge drinking that is very common. And that is the reason why this cause a problem to all of us. It has been clearly mentioned that almost 30% of the patient are having alcohol dependence and they have alcohol related problems. In the country like India, the situation may be really worse. This is the slide which has already been shown, the J-shaped cow which is there. Uh, doctor suggested two glass of wine a day is healthy. Look at the size of the glass he is drinking. CV, non-CV death, this is very in interesting. What we have to focus more, there is there may be a reduction in the CV mortality, but non-CV mortality is not that much reduced, and that is the reason alcohol has never been recommended for uh, uh, health. Uh, this is a very interesting article, it's clearly shown. 
that the disadvantage, there may be some diabetes or cardiovascular advantage in the form of negative, but overall there are so many disadvantages in the form of cancer, diabetes, cirrhosis. So overall if you look, there is always a high chance of cardiovascular, uh, uh, always a high chance of problem rather than the benefit of it. This is the person who has read that boozers live longer study, is having wine directly inside the vein and vital cells are falling and doctor is giving this shock to this patient. This is the health and a psychological problem. As I have told, the health is not merely a good physic, it is also related to the uh, psychology. And as you can see, the uh, alcohol has a tremendous psychological problem. Don't drink, this is the, another problem. As you can see here, most of the patient, almost 30 or 40 percent of the patient, 50 percent of the person who is having alcohol, they have a binge drinking or a heavy drinking. Very few have a very uh, standard way of drinking. Second important thing is along with the smoking, most of the patients also have a habit of smoking. The diet which we take along with the, in the form of biting is also containing fat and it is bad for the heart. This is what has been shown clearly that uh, it is not only harmful to the person who is drinking but also to the family member. As you can see alcohol is a maximum chance of family also being suffered. This is the cost which has been involved, this is mortality, crime, vehicle accident, everything is high and tremendous cost is involved with the alcohol. This is the article which Anish also has mentioned. It clearly tells the lower line he didn't uh, read properly. The increased awareness alcohol should never, should never universally be prescribed to the health enhancement for non-drinking individual owing to lack of randomized outcome data and a potential. He read the upper one, but he did not read the lower one, which is also very important. Alcohol abuse is the third largest preventable cause of death. As you can see, there are so many problems. Accident, stroke, cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrhythmia, sudden cardiac, cirrhosis, fetal sleep, apnea syndrome, everything is there. So it is better. And American Association guideline clearly warned the people not to start drinking. That is because there is always a problem of the abuse. Thank you very much. But a very important point and food for thought is this. Telling people to avoid anything, not alcohol. You take anything, just let us leave alcohol. Telling people to avoid anything because of the potential dangers of heavy use may not be in the best health interest of public. See, if we talk about nuclear energy, so nuclear energy destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but then world never stopped producing nuclear energy, world never stopped researching for nuclear energy, world never stopped thinking then how to make nuclear energy to the help of world. So it's very important at this stage, rather than becoming very biased on a particular point, let's decide here there is something which, is, which can be potentially helpful to so many people which has an easy access, which has no harm provided a certain discipline is maintained, then why can't we think? I don't think there has to be a mental sort of, emotional sort of blockage. Another point what Dr. Rumil Shah mentioned is health is a comprehensive thing. It's a not only absence of disease, but mental, physical, psychological, social, well-being. Ask those who drink whether they feel better socially, mentally, as compared to those who do not drink. My dear sir, it's very important. See, it has been searched very well that people who People who drink on a regular basis are more emotional, more sensitive, they are more helpful to the others, they take help of others, they take, give help of others very well, and they are more mixing kind of people, more loving people. So I think alcohol in a moderation brings better health. So what arguments which he makes, I think only one point which world needs to decide is number one, we need to define certain genes by which we can say that this person is not likely to be a problem drinker. Thank you. This is, this is uh, another interesting thing as you can see here. For women, there is no even cardiovascular advantage. Maybe having little cardiovascular advantage, but look at the overall injury, cancer dose, definitely there is no, dis no advantage. As I told in the beginning, 12 things to remember about alcohol, there will be disadvantage in 2012. Three ways one should uh, avoid from alcohol, deterioration of your body, your health, may result into death and liability, it's not against yourself only, but surrounding people also are important. Alcohol is benefit not, not for the health, but it is definitely good for government. You can get more tax. Companies producing the alcohol, trauma surgeons, psychiatrists, gastroenterologists, oncologists, and sometimes cardiologists like Ajay who has cardiomyopathy or arrhythmia. Uh, this is the person who is thinking that alcohol keeps the germ when it is applied outside the body. So he started drinking it, thinking that it will kill all the, body, in, all the insects inside the body and I will be, uh, I, my life will be very good. No guideline, never recommends about alcohol. J-shaped cow, very sharp razor, double-edged sword. So may have a cardiac risk, as I have told, hypertension. Even with the smallest dose, there is definitely more chance, atrial fibrillation, cardiomyopathy, sudden cardiac death. 
Also, there are major non-cardiac risk, which uh, we have to keep in mind. Major social, uh, financial dependency, that is also very important. And there are so many other things in the life to do, Dr. Anish. Uh, exercise, yoga, so many things you may take statin for the prevention. Why to go for the alcohol? <laughs> Thank you very much.